maybe think you'd be a killer. Those who can openly laugh at a smoking monkey and cinephile sadist, but what do I know? I like killers made of movies. I break this flick five out of five, but what do I know? I like killers made of movies. But what do I know? I like killers made of movies. Well, out of there, Scream Freaks. Y'all may think I'm trying to be funny when I throw the disclaimer out there about liking Killer Tomatoes movies and all, but I am in fact a huge Killer Tomatoes fan. Billy and Mandy here will tell you. He really loves Killer Tomatoes. From the first driving flick out of his 78 to the fourth and final direct-to-video romp in the City of Love, as well as the short-lived cartoon series that helped launch a bold new direction in Rugrat Television, I, I can't get enough of this pop culture phenomenon. And when you're a big fan of a movie series, what do you want? Useless hunks of plastic reminding you of your favorite characters? Trash props for that personal movie museum in your closet? Maybe the talent's dirty socks? Well, when you're a film buff like I am, trivia's what I'm after. I just gotta know all there is to know about the ins and outs behind the scenes that made this unhealthy obsession of mine possible. What struggles are the filmmakers facing? Anything on screen a happy accident? Did they catch lightning in a milk or coke bottle? That's why for me and the rest of you Hungry Tomato fans out there, I'm going way beyond the usual color commentary review, entire plot recaps with myths and rumors found on Wikipedia and the incorrect movie database. I'm going where no horror host has gone before and heading straight to the well of Killer Tomato knowledge itself. Yes sir, it's my size split honor to take you Scream Freaks on a never before seen tour behind the history of the Killer Tomatoes franchise. And here as our tour guides are the head honchos behind the whole shebang from their hometown of San Diego, California, the Killer Tomatoes filmmakers themselves, producer, writer, actor, and director John DeBello, writer, actor, and creator of the Killer Tomatoes Costa Dillon, and producer, writer, actor Steve Peace, or Rock Peace, or James Stephen Peace. You know, I gotta ask, why so many names? Well, you know, I tried to remain anonymous, and uh, the closest I could come to it is have multiple aliases. Now, there's no better place to start than at the beginning, but there's already been plenty said about the origins of the first attack of the Kilo Tomatoes, from online interviews to anniversary DVD extras, so let's shake things up. Here to kick down the door to memory lane, let's hear it for the long lost fourth member of Foursquare Productions, Michael Grant. You know, there aren't very many people know that I had anything to do with Foursquare Productions. So, Mike, you were there when the tomatoes first started flying, huh? Steve and John were a pair. They, they were good friends in high school. John DeBello and I were debate partners. Costner and I have been friends since the eighth grade. One summer, Costner said, we should make a movie. Okay, how do we do that? And he said, well, John DeBello has been making movies for a long time. I knew John. So we called up John and we went over to his house and we started talking about making movies. One was a Super 8 with sound. I hate to say it, fellas, which was about the losing season uh, that our football team had. They lost every game. I made another one. Do they accept traveler's checks in Babusu land? A silent runaround thriller with a funny bone, the meat of this amateur flick follows secret agents on a mission to grab some poor gal who accidentally has top secret intel stuck in her mouth by Shady Dentist. It's a spoof on every spy extravaganza, 007 and the whole bit. Now, before y'all think this is going to be a laundry list of every home movie Foursquare shot in their backyard, this Super 8 feature is a key ingredient in their eventual recipe for success. Not only are their jokes and actors recycled in later Foursquare productions, this is Steve Peace's first time playing Lieutenant Wilbur Finletter, the heroically bumbling paratrooper who would become synonymous with the Killer Tomatoes series. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. John and Costa graduated a year ahead of me and they went to UC Davis, which is where I was headed. I moved in with them. One freshman and three sophomores. All four of us were in one apartment. We were really the most unexcited people you could think of. We didn't drink, we didn't smoke anything. We dressed what I would call conservatively. And on Saturdays, we played Monopoly. We signed up for a film class, cost out the idea of doing a spoof on horror films. For inspiration, Costa called back to a Japanese monster movie he once saw on TV that left a big impression on him for just how ridiculous a film could be. Attack of the Mushroom People. From the studio that unleashed Godzilla in the world, the meat of this flick focuses on shipwrecked yahoos fighting the urge to eat shrooms that turn them into rubber boogeymen. I ate them. With that spark in his imagination, Costa was off and running with an idea for a threat even more laughable than hug happy shroom heads. Costa, I think, zeroed in on it. whatever it is, we have to pick the most innocuous thing 
ever. Something that no one would think, I mean, how could it possibly be bad? And tomatoes came up and everybody agreed, absolutely. What could be more frightening than a rabid tomato? Clock in under 20 minutes, the meat of this attack of the killer tomatoes short is violence erupting across North America as tomatoes in every form from ripe love apples to BLTs and tomato juice come alive and attack votes without explanation. Only a war room of government officials played by Foursquare themselves can save the planet from laughable doom and defeat the unexpected red minutes with a secret weapon guaranteed to make them heroes. We filmed a lot of it in our apartment, a lot of it on campus with other students. We, we, hey, you want to be in a movie? Most people said, sure, what do I got to do? The driving force behind this was Costa. He has one of those inventive minds. He can visualize something and just know it's going to be funny. And then Steve and John come up with a, a rough idea of how this was going to be shot. We didn't take anything seriously. There was no social messaging going on here. It was all about poking fun at everything and making people laugh. And it seems to have worked. My role throughout was, if you need something, I can make it. One of the things we wanted was have a scene with a ruined city and a tank and tomatoes. I built a brick wall that was sort of tumbling down, took firecrackers, cut them in half, stuffed them in the barrel. We have another firecracker under a tomato. We got one good shot where the flash from the muzzle of the cannon went off and almost immediately the tomato blew up. It was very satisfying. Acosta and John graduated, went back to San Diego. They went professional. Foursquare Productions became a real company. They filmed them high school and college football games to make money. Mostly did TV commercials and training films, industrial films, and so forth. And in the meantime, we're working on the script for uh, Attack the Color Tomatoes. Knowing they're on to something special, Foursquare made it their mission to graduate their killer veggie short into a full-fledged feature they could shoot in their hometown of San Diego, their go-to backdrop for all their future films except when it ain't. <laughs> Combining the Killer Tomatoes plot with antics from Gone with Babusa Land to pan out the runtime, the meat of this attack of the Killer Tomatoes feature hits the ground running with folks across the nation being massacred by a baffling tomato uprising. As soldiers are deployed in every nook and cranny of America to defend citizens against this tasty threat, the President orders a tomato task force be loaded into an unmarked rambler and dig up the root of this evil. Answering the call is Special Agent Mason Dixon, Master of Disguise Sam Smith, swimming experts Greta Adambaum and Greg Colburn, because don't forget tomatoes can swim now, and last but far from least, Paratrooper Lieutenant Wilbur Fanletter. Divided, they stumble through parodies of The Six Million Dollar Man, Jaws, and The Man of Steel, while matching wits with crooked politicians and oversized tomatoes to one of the most deftone victories ever committed to celluloid, making Foursquare's first big movie a smashing success. The title, the opening credits, we got a bunch of, of boiled tomatoes and a couple of concrete blocks with a plate of glass over it. And underneath that, we had the camera pointing up. And third floor, we started dropping tomatoes, you know, one, two, three at a time. And when they hit, they would splatter. With investments from family and friends to make the worst movie they could on purpose, Foursquare had just enough capital to buy top shelf talent at the time, like a fellow who played a priest in Harold Maude and Jack Riley from The Bob Newhart Show. My agent called me and they said, uh, it's not a big picture or anything, but Jack, it's a thousand dollars. Nobody will ever hear about this. Of course, they could only afford them for the scampiest of scenes, leaving Peace all the opportunity he needed to steal their thunder. Will this happen because I was cheap, I was free. When you have a limited budget, you're looking at locations and talent. Because that Wilbur Finletter character appears a lot, you don't have to be efficient with him and you can block out the movie from a budgeting perspective around the other actors that you are paying. But little did Foursquare know there were other budding talents dipping their toes into the entertainment pool, like the future star of Twin Peaks and Return of the Living Dead Part Two, Dana Ashbrook, playing the youngin' in the scene when the killer tomatoes attack the beach. Other up-and-coming talents include some famous musicians, right? 
The original score for the first film, Gordon Goodwin, is now renowned in his own regard. He's a Grammy Award-winning composer and big band leader. Fu Cameron just got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He was in school with us. He was the singer of Purity Love. Putrid Polka is the most memorable tune in the movie next to the Killer Tomatoes theme. Not only does this off-key torture ballad make humans fall to their knees, it proves to be the tomatoes' greatest weakness and weaponized for their downfall. What could inspire such a mind-numbing ditty? Donny Osmond was popular at the time, and I remember it was just this whiny little Phoebe Bethan voice singing love songs that we just thought, this is just awful. And it seems like that's the kind of music that could lead a lot of people to their deaths. But let's not forget the real stars in the movie who put butts in the theater. The Killer Tomatoes! Must have been a real chore for Michael to pull these homemade effects off. That would have been fun, but I was going to graduate school. I wasn't going to have time to participate. It, it just wasn't in the cards. We needed to uh, expand the perception of size of the crew, which was three. They needed more professional props uh, and effects. Not me cobbling together something to make it look like whatever it was they needed. It, was, it took up a lot of my life because I was the production designer. It was not easy to make giant tomatoes. What we ended up with is it's a kind of a foam that you add parts A and B together and it, it foams up and hardens. And we just dug a semicircle in the ground and made a mold. So we started casting these tomatoes a half at a time and gluing them together. And then you have the other side of the thing of when you have somebody come up and say, you know, I can see the cart underneath the tomato. Oh, really? Can you? Is that right? My God, I was, we'll have to go back and fix that. <laughs> we kept getting the question, well, where do the tomatoes come from? We never occurred to us that people would take this tomato seriously enough to worry about where the hell they came from. This oversight led to Foursquare adding a last minute scene to their shooting schedule that gives an all new meaning to happy accidents on set. Actor almost dies in crash. The next morning it was on the Today Show. Got gigantic publicity out of it. The accident occurred in a tomato field in Oceanside. Four Square Productions of National City was shooting some final scenes for a comedy feature film, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. The ground came at me and it went away and at me and away and I thought, this is it, you know? Then there was, get him out of there, get him out of there, after we hit the ground, because they thought the, the tanks were going to explode. And I thought to myself, man, this would be a really cool scene if we could get these guys to crawl away from the helicopter and actually work this into the movie. I mean, it's a and, great uh, scene. Yeah, it's a great scene. It's one of the big scenes in the film. Best special effects in history, you just crash a helicopter. As dangerous as that was, even your safer effects proved risky. We built a really cool miniaturization set that we used in our big climatic battle scene. Just before we started filming, guy doing the work on it decided he was going to test quality of the explosions that he could do in the water, and he threw in a cherry bomb that was a bit too big, um, and he blew out the bottom of the set, and the water went all over the studio, and that was not a pretty sight. The stupidest thing that happened is that we chose Costa Dillon to be the driver. Uh, in the scene when uh, I was being dragged behind a car. It was on a belly board uh, that you would use to work on a car. As I'm whipped around the corner, we see that our crack crew who had allegedly made sure everything was safe on the street had failed to note uh, that a car was parked along the side of the road. And I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, stop, stop, stop the car. And suddenly it occurred to me that Costa was driving. And of course, Costa's deaf in his left ear. Storyboarded it extensively on three by five cards. Steve met the differential <laughs> on the rear end of this car, cracking the goggles, breaking the glass out of them. Oh my God, one of the actors is dead. I still have most of the parachute and Finler's uniform. If you believe in it and you can see it, this shit happens. That's why every now and then you flip on the TV and you see some shit, you'd be like, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> like, how, did, how does Attack of the Killer Tomatoes even fucking happen? Or? It was 50% luck and 50% planning. We knew we had a zig while everybody else zagged because we were outside of the studio system. We wanted to take a chance. We didn't want to do just the next Roger Corman movie and move up through the system that way. We were going to go out there and do something completely different that we thought was funny. 
You do Attack of the Killer Tomatoes when you're 25. You don't do it when you're 35. Because when you're 35, you look at the numbers and say the odds are against you. When you're 25, you go for it. That was the difference that allowed the spark to take hold. I saw in my mind's eye when we were shooting the movie that I would go to a drive-in theater and I would see Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. And that's exactly what happened. And it was not a surprise. It was expected. In fact, the hardest difficulties we had, ironically, we were first dealing with whatever they call the people that determine the ratings, but they were very close to giving Killer Tomatoes an R rating based on the fact there was what they called off-screen violence. We actually had to fight to make sure we didn't get an R rating. We had thought we were making sure we wouldn't get a G rating. In those days, having a G rating theatrically was death. So you wanted to land in a PG space. Never occurred to us. We'd have a problem with a potential R rating. There's no nudity in the picture, you know. There was always a debate early on about whether we belonged in various categories. Because is it comedy? Is people, you know, call it horror? It's the musical aspect. Well, can you really call it a bad film because you know, these guys were playing with being a bad film, quote, on purpose. The Medbed brothers um, had uh, had contacted me about putting Killer Tomatoes in the world's worst film festival. And I said, yes, as long as we win. And uh, that helped the property explode. I think there were lines, you know, around around the theater and it became a big deal. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a specific kind of humor. We, we always refer to the Killer Tomatoes as the best known least seen film in history because people know the title but they've never seen it. The original film played very well to two very diverse audiences, Midnight Showings and Matinees. It did really well with college students and eight-year-olds. Uh, high school kids didn't get it. The attack of the killer tomatoes. Yeah. That'll probably become like the Rocky the horror show. You know, be a cult thing. The steady long-term health of the theatrical market was theaters throughout the country running it in midnight films and then often in pairing it with uh, Rocky Horror and running Rocky Horror at midnight and then they could run Killer Tomatoes with it and then run Killer Tomatoes in the matinees. Because in those days, Rocky Horror was not, you couldn't show it in matinees, you couldn't possibly let kids see it, right? I remember I was in Hawaii once and a guy walks up to me, he says, aren't you Steve Peace? And so I'm, I'm trying to size the guy up, whether he's going to hit me with a gun, what's bad things going to happen here. And he says, Wilbur Findler, you made me a millionaire. I go, oh, really? That's cool. How, how does that happen? He owned a local a chain of theaters in Hawaii. And he said he spent five years of his life doing nothing but running Rocky Horror and Killer Tomatoes and then sold the theaters and retired. And so I said, that's great. Did better than we did. <laughs> So what happened next? After all the sweat and near-death experiences that went into realizing a cinematic pipe dream on celluloid, how did this musical horror spoof from the 70s simmer over time to blow up into an even bigger pop culture phenomenon over the next two decades? We'll settle up, Scream Freaks, and we'll find out together. To follow up their success as indie filmmakers, Foursquare turned their filmmaking ambitions toward a different brand of comedy with their first studio picture. But if this one isn't silly enough for you, Foursquare Productions is about to announce yet another feature-length motion picture. It will not feature tomatoes. Instead, it will feature beer. Meet the Happy Hour Detectives. Their first assignment? Recover a secret formula which has the most incredible side effects. The problem is... Got any Marshall beer? It's too super, and it's addictive. The beer drinking age was lowered to six yesterday, meaning there's a whole new market out there. Mommy, can I ask more beer on my cereal? Of course. We started what we thought was a pretty funny idea, that if you develop the formula that you can put in anything that make people want it, the good altruistic person wanted people to brush their teeth, so we put it in toothpaste, and the evil corporate people would put it in beer or anything else to get people to take. Sour Grapes was the original title. The distributor wanted to change it, but the international rights stayed with the original title of Sour Grapes. Sour Grapes, I mean, Happy Hour didn't make any sense to me, besides there's six other movies called Happy Hour. Especially that time period, the, the one sheet, the poster, looks nothing like the movie. Unfortunately, um, we had some setbacks early in the film. On the very first shot, on the very first day, we lost our DP to a to an accident with a stunt, and everybody had to shift positions. You know, there were a number of days on the set. It was fun. I liked working with uh, Jamie Farr, and uh, 
Eddie Deason and, and a few others. They were, they were great to work with. Despite working with their biggest ensemble of talent yet, the real breakout star was Debbie Fairs as Miss Shepard, the villain's comical bombshell of a secretary everyone underestimates. They wanted it to be an R film. We didn't, you know, the idea that we cared <laughs> what its rating was. Let's make sure we get some R stuff in there. Um, was kind of silly to us. And other changes they made just kind of ruined the whole, the whole concept. The farce of it got lost in the um, changes that the TMS kept demanding. They just kept changing the story too much. Well, there's, there's probably five or ten minutes that's really good and a lot that uh, may be less than great. But uh, we had enough freedom to do what we wanted. My partner, Rick, actually was the one who made contact with Foursquare. And uh, we used to do music for CBS and NBC and all kinds of commercials and stuff. But Rick always wanted to be a film scorer. He loved John Williams and he loved film scores. But uh, this was too much for him to do on his own, you know. Even a small movie is a lot of work. So he asked me if I wanted to co-score it with him. And uh, I said, sure, you know, let's try it. I mean, I've done some, so, some scores before then, mostly short films or commercials. So he introduced me to uh, the director, John DiBello, and it was a lot of fun. What about money? There's, there's a lot of costs imposed on you in a variety of ways. So you have to, you know, deal with that aspect. That was done under a little bit of adversity, but uh, you know, film got done and, and got released. I have three sons, and two out of three of them insist that Happy Hour is the best movie. They love, they love it, um, and they I constantly getting big. Got to do a remake of Happy Hour. Got to do a remake. Of that was our first experience with a studio. They put just so many fingers in it. Change this, change that. Do this, do that. That the whole original concept got diluted and beat up to the point where I can't even watch the film now. Well, did y'all at least make enough to bankroll the next flick you wanted to make? That was, well, minimal income, if any, you know, just, we weren't that famous. <laughs> I went to work for the legislature because Killer Tomatoes wasn't making any money yet. I actually <laughs> had done the TV spots for a local assembly member. And so he comes to me and says, hey, you know, any chance you'd be willing to stay on and be my chief of staff? I go to DeBello, I go, John, <laughs> I'm gonna go take this job. But what was going on with the Killer Tomatoes property in the meantime? Foursquare didn't have any plans for a sequel, but that didn't keep game developers from continuing the fight against the Red Menace with a slew of video games putting fans right in the action. Things were happening so quickly in the 80s with new technologies and uh, we got a lot of calls and we, we tried to take advantage where we could and uh, get the property out. First there was the Revenge of the Beefsteak Tomatoes for the Atari 2600 in 83. Oh, no, I think, you know, that, I had never even heard of it till now, <laughs> so... <laughs> no? Well, oh. well then how about the Revenge of the Killer Tomatoes for the ZX Spectrum in 84? No, in fact, we um, had to threaten litigation to stop its distribution. Well, what about Global Software's attack of the Killer Tomatoes computer game from 86, where fans play a factory worker who's got to squish every tomato flat for shifts up? It was not the breakthrough for the game industry by any stretch of the imagination. Underperformed the movie. You know, for brand awareness, they were fun, but it really wasn't driving the franchise and, and it really didn't have any effect on the other projects that we did. While it seemed the joke of man-eating tomatoes had run its course, that all changed one Saturday morning in 86 when Attack of the Killer's Tomatoes found a whole new audience. A hit show starring Rugrat versions of Jim Henson's Hand Critters, Muppet Babies used their unbridled imaginations every episode to go on comical adventures with themes influenced by pop culture. In Season 3's The Weirdo Zone, they spoofed the attack of the Killer Tomatoes while using clips in the movie. Well, we, we approved the use for Muppet Babies, what caused the revival. In fact, this is where the relationship between Margaret Lesh and our team began. Now you Scream Freaks remember that name, because she plays a vital role in the boom of Killer Tomatoes fandom later on. Proven to be one of the show's more popular episodes, Marvel Productions' parent company, New World Pictures, saw an opportunity to invest in what could prove to be a lucrative property and approach Foursquare with an offer they couldn't refuse. With New World, we had somebody who's willing to write us a big check and say, go give us a movie. Uh, again, we didn't have any strings or oversight on it. They, I'm sure, had very low expectations. 
And my favorite moment of that whole New World experience was when I went to meet with their head of production and they weren't quite sure why Attack of the Killer Tomatoes was so popular. They just knew that it worked. And it was a cult film and you either got it or you didn't. And apparently a lot of people at New World just saw the numbers and really didn't understand the movie. So I went in and I said, yeah, we're going to have fun with merchandise and we've come up with a fuzzy tomato doll. We've got a really good cast. And the head of production looked at me and said, well, just don't make it too good. And that was because as far as they were concerned, it was just a cult movie and they had no idea what it was. But it may be the first and only time in the history of Hollywood where the instructions from the studio was, don't make it too good. Finding themselves in the right time and place when sequels were all the rage, Foursquare returned to the roots with an all-new tomato comedy. Set a few years after mankind squashes would-be oppressors in the Great Tomato War with Toon Deaf Tunes, tomatoes have been outlawed for the public safety and things have really quieted down. So much so, Finletter retires a famous war hero and opens a tomatoless pizza parlor in San Diego with his nephew Chad. But just on the other side of town, of all places, the mysterious madman responsible for the kill of tomatoes, Professor Gain Green, has created a whole new breed of tomato people immune to melodic meltdowns and prepares them for a second tomato war. Only Chad and his roommate Matt catch wind of this coming invasion after Chad falls head over heels for Gang Green's favorite tomato arm candy and it's up to them in a mutant fuzzball reject to bring the tomato task force out of retirement and save the world once again. But first things first, who would play all these new characters? What can you say? Everybody wants to be in movies. And again, because we had a standing company, we owned a, you know, we had a building uh, here in San Diego. We had just lines down the block of uh, people showing up with their headshots wanting to be famous. <laughs> you can find people who look the way you want a person to look, male or female, the, the, but they can't all act. <laughs> John made some, what turned out to be pretty solid casting choices in that picture, one in particular, that has given that movie a lot of life. You get a hold of George Clooney yet? You mean super world famous coffee bush and movie millionaire George Clooney? Sure, we shot him an invitation to join this celebratory shindig down memory lane, but fact is... What's the worst film you've ever made, in your judgment? Well, I've done a few bad ones. It's tough. I've done... Uh, I'm in one of the more, more celebrated bad films called Return of the Killer Tomatoes. I missed that one. I don't know how. I don't know how you missed it. Um, I say lines like... That was the bravest thing I've ever seen a vegetable do. And with a straight face. Well, at least his co-star Anthony Stark was more willing to retread his time playing Chad, the love-struck firecracker of a pizza delivery boy caught in the thick of the tomato controversy. Return of the Killer Tomatoes was my second feature. It was like the summer of 87, and George had already been cast as like the best friend. And so they were still looking for Chad, the like hero of the story. And so I came in and read for it, and I just loved the script. I just, it made me laugh out loud. It was so much fun to play Anthony Stark and George Clooney against each other because George is the epitome of laid back in terms of his cool. And he took that even a step farther to play against Tony. George is a very funny guy in person. We were just kind of talking about this, this movie and how we should try to go about it to really make it funny. If it ends up funny, you know, you, 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 you can be forgiven just about anything, but if it's not funny, it's gonna be a real, real turkey. He was kind of leaning in the direction of being more deadpan. So I thought I would counter that by having Chad be very sincere, kind of wide-eyed, and when things started to go sideways, apoplectic. He was the worst friggin' hero ever. Needing a pretty face who knew her way around killer vegetables, Foursquare eventually pegged a young TV actress named Karen Missile to play the other half of Chad's science experiment romance, Tara, a tomato girl who turns into a love apple anytime Beethoven's blasting nearby. And I was actually shooting Beans Baxter up in Vancouver uh, for Fox and my agent called and, and told me about this movie and I had no idea about the first film so I was just clueless. We went back and forth on the auditions for a while and then they came through and called and said you're going to San Diego. Yeah. Karen is she, she's a pretty girl and she had a, a good sense of humor and you know a good actress. The good Lord uh, creates some of us humans 
that are very attractive and some of us uh, are really good actors and some of us have a really good sense of humor. It's not easy to find all those attributes in a single person and Karen fit the bill. I just tried not to have my jaw hanging open because she was so hot. That was the real battle for me. She was attractive, but she was also had that sort of girl next door feel, which was what we were going for. But she also had a, a dry sense of humor. There's not much to focus on on being a tomato. I mean, tomato doesn't do that much. It was kind of a throwback to the old sci-fi films. So I, you know, I thought about those movies and how they were just straight ahead deadpan, the zombies, if you will, because that's, that's kind of how I saw the, the tomato. While the first flick pins the blame of the Killer Tomatoes on press secretary Jim Richardson, Return of the Killer Tomatoes does a little retconning and introduces Richardson's secret partner in crime, the actual mastermind behind the creation of the Killer Tomatoes no one ever found, Professor Mortimer Gang Green. While keeping their options open, Foursquare knew who they wanted to cast in this pivotal role. We reached out to a number of, uh, you know, what, what I would call 60s uh, Hollywood TV icons because we wanted that sort of fun element to it. And, uh, you know, we, we had thought about the possibility of Dick Van Dyke. We tried to get Ricardo Montalban, which his reply was he'd read the script and he didn't get it. And I kept thinking, and he got Wrath of Khan. We looked at Adam West. I was always a John Aston fan, was hoping he'd want to do it. It was my understanding it was down between the two of them, but I think we ended up on the uh, good side of that ledger by having John Aston. He was, he was fantastic. No way! You're saying the Riddler defeated Batman after all? Uh, if what you say is true, yes. <laughs> I was hoping for John from day one, and you don't always get what you wish for, but in this particular case, we did. They just called me up, and uh, they were offering a, a short term of work and uh, some good money, or at least it was to me. So I, uh, I took it. But I've always been a huge John Aston fan. I'll tell you how much of a fan I was. Before Adam's Family, he did a great series with Marty Ingalls called I'm Dickens, He's Fenster, which probably ran for a season, but I loved it when I was a kid. John's great. All right. You couldn't have gotten anybody better. Not only was he great in the part, he's just terrific to work with. He's just a really nice guy. Anything other than a paycheck drawing to the part? Well, I'm the son of a scientist. A very good one, actually. I don't know, maybe some people thought he was a little crazy. <laughs> they were measuring the effect of cosmic rays. He was the first person on Earth to uh, talk to a, a radio in space and then getting messages back. He, he was one of our principal weapons developers before and during World War II. He didn't think Hitler was a good person and he wanted very much to defeat him. They invented the printed circuit to build a possible death ray. <laughs> uh, fortunately, it never worked out. While Return of the Killer Tomatoes reintroduces audiences to a revamp of the first flick's catchy theme song, this sucker opens with his own signature ditty fans would happily come to identify it by. I did sing big breasted women go to the beach and take their tops off, and I'm sticking by that. That's, that was a title that John gave us, and I just ran with it. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I thought this, this needs a beach boy kind of a, of a feel to it since it was on the beach, you know. Once we got the call to, to do this, and Rick asked me if I want, he got the call and he asked me if I wanted to co, co write it with him. So I said, sure. You know, I guess it was enough time after. Uh, happy hour that uh, I said, fine, you know, because you forget how much work these things are. Even even a small movie is a hell of a lot of work. But just like the movie reminds us, it's the tomatoes we're here for. Maybe it was easier to take an already existing song, unless you didn't like the song. <laughs> then it's like pulling teeth. You know, so we had fun doing it. It, it, didn't, uh, it didn't take a lot of work to rearrange it. Getting my wife in to help us, she, she was in the background vocals with the tomatoes, tomatoes. Rick, he'd bring something to me and he'd say, okay, I wrote this and I'm going for a sound like detective movies that were famous at the time that were very electronic scores. And uh, he, was, he was gearing a lot of it towards that. 
Rick uh, did more of the uh, the live instrument writing. So we would get sax in there and French horn and some vocals here and there. So my job was more of the synth scoring and songwriting. I, I was the guy who wrote most of the songs for the film, other than the theme song. I was always disappointed y'all went with tomato people instead of actual tomato monsters like in the first movie. Were the shoestrings that tight in this budget or y'all just trying to avoid the headache of working with big ass props? I can't remember that specifically we thought that that was a driving force for the story. I think we just like the story. I, I don't think we particularly were trying to avoid making giant tomatoes. I mean, we'd actually learned how to do it by then. No! <laughs> Enough of this foolishness. John liked the part. You know, he liked doing it. He wanted to give it what it deserved. So we would talk about what King Green wants here, and what's he doing, and where do we go next, and should we play this large or play it down, or, or whatever it was. Just before we were about to shoot, the day before, I said, John, maybe I should look at the, uh, at the first movie just so I can be in coordination with what you're doing here and he said no you don't want to see it he said it's really a bad movie <laughs> and we hope to improve on things with, with this one I've, I've never seen uh any of the uh to the best of my recollection anyway any of the subsequent films <laughs> i did see the first one eventually and I understand what John was talking about. <laughs> Igor, come! Sir, it is my pleasure to respond to your immediate needs, and I'd just like to say Listen that I... Listen to me, pretty boy! Playing Gang Green's unconventional henchman with hopes for a break into the TV news, Steve Lundquist was an Olympic gold medalist who swapped competitive swimming for dipping his toes into the acting pool. Four square. They knew who I was and brought me in for an interview, and we all just got along. They, they just were always laughing and always having fun and coming up with just stupid stuff. And it worked. I was laughing all the time. It just does not look right for a noted misanthrope of my stature to have a servant who looks like you. I'm sorry, sir. I mean, master. I realize I'm somewhat of a disappointment to you. How's this? So super nice. They just said wing it. <laughs> And as a country boy, our, my, my, my English is really goodly, so I won it. Steve Lundquist, I think, was kind of a natural in the part. So the two of them, I thought, were pretty funny together. I, I still watch those scenes, um, even though I was there live watching them shoot them. Um, and I still think their the chemistry between the two of them worked well. We took a liking to one another. Uh, I had remembered him well from the 84 Olympics. So I was already a fan of his you know, when we met. I, I was a big fan of his, so I was always quizzing him about his past movies. He's been around the block once or twice, and, and he knows how to, to get along, he knows how to keep it light, and it is a comedy, so you might as well keep it light. Anybody who gets serious about it, you know, that's their problem. Nice sense of humor, too. I mean, that was, uh, it, it was fun to work with him. Spoofing toyetic stunts by big box office movies pushing profitable mascots, Foursquare created their own joke of a cash cow, Fuzzy Tomato. I liked the Fuzzy Tomato. There was a bond with me and FT. He made it fun. I wanted to take that puppet home, but it didn't happen. Given y'all owe the sequel to the Muppet Babies for generating new interest in the Killer Tomatoes, y'all ever think to ask Jim Henson's help with FT? You know, we didn't. Uh, we made our own puppets because I was operating them a couple times. You know, I like the FT character. I was laying on the floor with the controls making the puppet move. Uh, I don't think we ever even considered to going to some bigger house because that would have been pie in the sky, I think, for us. We're, I mean, we're a run and gun, low budget movies, you know. <laughs> for a low budget movie, I think we were down there for like five weeks, which is a lot of shooting. A lot of fun, it was summertime. John Aston, he's a lovely guy. He, you know, I just remember that he was very uh, committed Buddhist and vegetarian and, you know, just a very spiritual, um, lovely, warm person. And it was a favorite of mine from the, from the Adams Family, of course. Speaking of the Adams Family, are those original Gomez threads you're wearing in that one scene? 
They supplied one. Uh, I never owned one. All of that was by wardrobe. We were asked to bring our own stuff to set and then wardrobe handpicked what they wanted for each scene. I loved the 50s dress. That was a piece that I actually owned. It fit perfectly with that housewife look. It wasn't really me, but the snake. No, I passed on that. Raisinets, <laughs> gummy bears, why not? Kiwi, <laughs> they laughed at me in Vienna, but now, the final master stroke, a dab of peanut butter. I wonder what these things tasted like with tomato sauce. Ugh. These tomatoless pizzas are so funny and gross at the same time with their crazy toppings. Was anybody triple dog daring y'all take a bite out of them afterward? Yeah, well, we did. We didn't like any of them. <laughs> I mean, have you looked at the close-up of that pizza? It was so disgusting. And it sat there for a really long time. <laughs> on top of everything else. The ingredients of the pizza in Return of the Killer Tomatoes, we thought we were so witty because we had such bizarre ingredients in pizza. And I'll be gosh darned if in the next decade, just about everything we had on that pizza now exists on actual pizzas. It's ironic, you know, now since people have gluten-free this and, and dairy-free mm -hmm. that, they actually make pizzas without tomato sauce or cheese on them. So it's, it, we were ahead of our time. We sort of proceeded Wolfgang Puck in terms of our culinary expertise, although that wasn't the intention. The one with the gummy bears, I mean, I think people do that now. <laughs> do you want to make love? <sighs> Karen was just so beautiful and so kind. She was very sweet and serious about the work as an actress, even though it was a comedy. She wanted to like nail all her stuff and was very disciplined in a good way. She could be straight and she could be funny enormously attractive and a lot of sex appeal she is my creation i made her for my needs and it's my needs that she serves <laughs> you wouldn't believe what she can do with six milk bottles and a tuning fork <laughs> six milk bottles and a tuning fork and karen oh my goodness <laughs> You know, and, and like, I don't know, what, what sexually would you do with six milk, milk bottles of a tuning fork? Oh, I, probably a lot of things. I mean, uh, there's a lot to be done with milk bottles and tuning forks. It may have inspired uh, subsequent uh, intimate events. I have no idea. You could spend hours with just six milk bottles. <laughs> Ooh, what's striking you funny? You know, you gotta leave a little bit to your imagination. Obviously she was making music. That's where I go with it. That's not where everyone else went with it. I like to think it was keeping the vegetables happy with the music. Unable to get a hold of George Wilson, who played the evil press secretary, Jim Richardson, in the original Killers Made Us Flick, Foursquare recast this part with stand-up comedian Rick Rockwell. Pee Wee Herman as a gynecologist. Oh, uh, oh, uh. I had never seen the first movie uh, before I uh, agreed to be in the sequel. And it didn't matter that they had me at Killer Tomatoes. So that was all it took for me. And it's funny because when they had me in makeup like Jim Richardson, I look like I do now with gray hair and, and tried to put some aging on me. So this is what Jim Richardson would look like if it was 20 years ago. The teleprompter's cued and the camera's white balanced. <sighs> What? With the guy that, uh, that I enjoyed hanging out with the most was probably Steve Lundquist. He was just so much fun to be around. He has a great sense of humor and he's, he's very charismatic. Such a natural. He just has his character and he fit into it like an old pair of jeans. He comes across in real life just like he does on the screen. I tried to wheedle my way into as many roles as I could get. You know, I suggested that I could do it, and I had this character that I could use in, in the back room to be this guy and uh, selling the uh, black market tomatoes. Don't give me no Joe Caccioni routine here. This is some of the finest Acapulco Red. It was really fun. It was so much fun very happy to do whatever it was. I mean, if they had asked me to clean floors, I would have done that too. And, uh, you know, uh, with a toothbrush. So touch me there. You know I like
like it when you touch me there. Touch me there. <laughs> I wrote that song. That was an interesting one. I didn't do the vocal on that, but I wrote the song. I thought this would be really interesting if I wrote a song that sounded like a legitimate love song. And some ways through the song, all of a sudden got totally outrageous. So I took a chance, you know, I didn't, I didn't get any uh, feedback before I did it. I was just hoping John uh, would like it. Luckily enough, we were able to get this guy from San Diego who was an old timer, jingle singer named Dick Noel. And he happened to sound like Frank Sinatra. As close as you can get without getting sued. <laughs> And this was, this was like, like the best part without a kiss. for me personally, it was a highlight. Of course, I don't know if Tara loves Chad as much as she loves Toast, because she makes a lot of it. You're right, there was a lot of Toast in that movie. Tara's fascination was with the toaster. Just the mechanics of, woo, there it goes, you know. I had a lot of fun with that. I didn't eat very much of it, but made piles of it you know, through, oh my gosh, it became one of those running gags. I always had toast in my hand. George and I would uh, get together in either his trailer or my trailer before we started the day, and we would punch things up, tweak things, add jokes. So come on, who hates the Grateful Dead? She loves the farm report. She tapes the farm report. She plays it again and again and again. There was a lot of sprinting. And, and, and stuff in this movie. It had enormous energy when he wanted it, you know, when it was right. And I was like 24 at the time, and I, and I was like hyper anyway, so I, I loved all that stuff. That's what Anthony Stark is like all the time. <laughs> Anthony Stark comes out of the gate fast, and in a rehearsal in the first take, he's on. He's one of those actors, he's very hyper-focused and was in his character, like, all the time. And George was just a laugh a minute and just really laid back and his comedic timing was impeccable. Sometimes George had to kind of help bring Tony down a bit. No kidding. How does anyone corral a performance this ecstatic? George would sort of come up to speed and the rehearsal was at like 70% and the first take at 85%. And so as he ramped up, Tony, I'm not saying would lose energy, but he wouldn't be building. If anything, he's coming down a little bit. So you sort of have to find the middle part of the X to find the scene where they're where they're both really in sync. And it's not unique to them, it's just different acting styles. So that intensity was fun, but you know, we had to sort of balance it. On DeBello is really the person who holds it all together. He, he is one of the people in life that I look up to the most. I think he is a really, really exceptional person. That was awesome. He ran a tight ship. He knew what he wanted. Uh, we didn't do 50 takes, thank goodness. He just said, hey, dude, memorize your lines better. So, you know, again, dumb jock. So smart, so competent at everything he undertakes. John's a great guy, and he, he was there to have fun. Obviously, anytime you're directing a movie, it's difficult. And these movies were kind of doing a lot with a little. So it was a hard job for him. He stays on an even keel, keeps a cool head, which is a very good quality for a director to have. Because if he's not panicking, department heads go, I guess I won't panic either. Oh, I was so... Uh, let's save the restaurant review. Lady, just tell us about the tomato. Well, I was sitting there by myself and this... Wait, wait, wait a minute. You, you were alone? Well, yeah. What's yeah. the matter? You, you couldn't get a date? What? What are you... What about doing? your husband? Well, he, he's dead. What was it? Suicide, maybe? Oh, Ma'am, that's ancient history. You should have found somebody by now. I did that mainly because we could save 600 bucks on a SAG actor. And if you saw the movie, you know how if you say something on screen, you got to pay, you got to pay that person. So we all made sure we had a few lines to save a few bucks. You can't see your feet. Do the words fat cow mean anything to you? We were having a little bit of fun with the media. What I was playing was actually based on a local Southern California reporter that uh, everything he said sounded just like this. And I had to basically yell just to try to match what that guy does every day in the news, which said to me, gosh, I, I don't know how sincere the journalism is, but I had fun doing it. So I can't help but notice you stepped up your special effects game in this flick. 
The special effects in this movie, we went to an independent design house. And he was very good at what he did. He was very polite. And this gentleman was actually part of a group of people who believed religiously that we would be returning to the planet Venus at some point in time. The way I met him was we had a film lab and we were doing some work for his group. And I was writing out an invoice for him. So I very politely asked him, do you believe we're going to the planet Venus? Is this check going to clear before you go? He actually smiled and said, yes, it will. And it did. And I ended up hiring him and he was a great guy to work with. I don't know if he's still around. The Venusians maybe took him to the home planet. But it's the 80s. I think it's time uh, for product placement. Give me that beer. This, uh, this generic stuff, you know, generic, it's not going to cut it. So uh, I say product placement. It'll work. I think you should trust me on this. I'm very proud of that gag because uh, I think we were the first to do it. It was just at that point where it was becoming like, holy crap, you know, with product placement in movies. But we did it in a way that was very funny, I thought. Um, we had a heck of a lot of fun making fun of product placement. Costa Dillon and, and George Clooney, and they're only seen together. Probably the, the greatest scene for both of them. They didn't give us any money. <laughs> they gave us free stuff. <laughs> but we had cartons of Nestle's Crunch Bars and, and cases of Moosehead beer and so forth. Uh, so we got some free food. <laughs> I'll be right back after this brief interruption. I'm driving a garbage truck and the door is hanging open the other way. And I'm telling you, I came literally inches of hitting about 10 trees because it stuck out about this far, further than, my, <laughs> further than my mirror. I really almost hit everything. Never again. That was actually written by myself and Ricks and my other partner in our music protection company, Ron Walls. He and I wrote that, and uh, I think I'm singing that. Pretty sure. <laughs> All right, I gotta know the story behind the short shorts here, because this is the look that defines Igor later on in the Killer Tomatoes cartoon series. I used to work in TV news. Kind of late in San Diego, and being on the set, realized that the news people would often just dress from here up because that's all you saw. And uh, particularly the sports guy, <laughs> he, he often wore shorts and tennis shoes and, and a tie and a jacket. New World wanted we turned the character Mills to be uh, well, an rated film, and we did not because we knew we had a kids' audience, even though this was before the cartoon show. We didn't want an R-rated film because we didn't want to lose a potential kids' audience. So we had to shoot, you know, some R-rated scenes. The only thing that they asked us to do to get an R rating was to take one of the scenes we were already going to shoot with a young lady in an intimate situation in her uh, lingerie and just remove part of the lingerie so we'd get an R rating instead of a PG-13. The actors in that scene were George Clooney and Terry Weigel. And Terry Weigel was a Playboy centerfold. So we shot it with her top on, with her top off, because they made us. And <laughs> we did everything we could to make sure we never used the top off version. We ended up going PG-13 on it. It's just that, Hollywood mentality that if you're doing a low budget film, especially in those days, they wanted to, you know, the, that was the height of the TNA era. And so you, you needed to have topless women in your low budget movie. And we just didn't want to do that. If New World has an archive somewhere, that footage is in that archive. So what's the story on the prison Richardson's being held at? This a real joint? I think it's Donovan a Correctional Facility, I believe they call it now. It's wonderful when you, you know, you get to be a statist and then they name a prison after you. I think that's really special. That was in uh, Otay Mesa, I think, which is right down at the Mexican border. The prison was under construction. It had not been opened yet. The scenes we filmed in the prison were in the infirmary because they had completed that section of the prison first. We had a lunch break and John Aston came over and whispered some you know stuff about getting a shiv and who are we going to get tonight in my ear and i we played this off for about 10 minutes it was very funny my favorite line in the film was george clooney's line that was the bravest thing i've ever seen a vegetable do <laughs> they improved a lot a lot george is a master of improv george was i felt going somewhere you know i mean he was very talented Love George. His career took a little bit different path than mine. 
He's talented. I'm not. He has done so successfully well, and I'm so proud of him. And uh, just a good guy, too. He's just really charismatic as nobody's ever seen. Just a great guy. Return was a movie made for video. It did have a limited theatrical lease for purposes of promoting the picture. Of course, dear. Who wouldn't want one of these cute little dolls? They're the perfect gift for any boy or girl. And they're on sale in the lobby of this theater. Because Return of the Killer Tomatoes was a spoof of sequels, we intentionally put um, a spoof of E.T., F.T. in there so we could make a toy. And that was the whole idea to do that. It just wasn't so particularly successful. And we actually had people call to buy F.T. dolls, and we did sell some. Those were actually F.T props from the movie that we sold. We just did it for fun. We thought it was uh, just a goof. And my favorite was I was working late one night and it was a three-year-old girl on the phone wanting to buy an FT doll. And I was going to sell it to her, but her, but her mom unfortunately broke into the conversation, hung the phone up, so I couldn't make the sale. That would have been my first you know, direct response sale. Speaking of promotions, it must have helped having clips of the original Killer Tomatoes featured in the Elvira Mistress of the Dark movie, also from New World, just a few months after Return's release. I heard about it, but I didn't see it. We, we had uh, clips from Killer Tomatoes used in a, in a number of pictures. It was still playing midnight shows when Return was, uh, was produced. But you know, it didn't start there. She's been ribbing your flick for years, even back when she was initially hosting Movie Macabre. Now this time around, I'm serving up a little grabber called the Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. No, it was very cool, and uh, it was also a big deal. And there was a that was an era where Elvira, Rocky Horror, all these things were connected, so to speak. I mean, it was kind of that was the cult world. What a stupid movie! I mean, the acting is so bad in this turkey. How bad is it? Well, it's so bad that the tomatoes have started throwing rotten people at the screen. Her embracing the title was validation that we were real. Y'all ever get to meet the Queen of Halloween in person? Came close to meeting Elvira. I was in the same room with her because she was at a political event in Los Angeles. So I had an intimate encounter with Elvira in a room of six or seven hundred people. To this day, I wish Big Breasted Tomatoes go to the beach and take their tops off was a real movie. Would you have made it if given the chance? In a heartbeat. Oh, that would have been a fantastic motion picture, both artistically and commercially. And I think it would have special resonance today as sort of a, a very retro movie. That uh, essentially was the movie that was being made by most studios with an R rating at the time. So just like having fun with product placement, we had a little bit of fun with that too. But, you know, look, I think Return to Killer's Maze is a good little movie. I think it's a good little script. When you do a movie like The Killer Tomatoes, it's, it's a low-budget slapstick film. It's not a career builder. I think they were stunned at how much movie they got. Uh, they wrote us a check, probably figured we'd put half of it in our pocket, and we didn't. We made the movie and for what they gave us to make it for. Of all the movies I've done, Foursquare was the most delightful to work with. There was a relaxed feeling about the, uh, the film. Because all those guys, the Foursquare guys, were uh, a bunch of nice squares from high school. They, uh, they had fun. We were allotted that creative freedom to kind of just wing it. And, and those were the scenes that came off the best. Foursquare is the Hollywood antidote. John and Steve and Costa, it was like doing a movie with, you know, your high school friends. That's what it's like to work, you know, with Foursquare. And it's a professional operation, don't get me wrong. I mean, they really have their act together. But it's really fun to work in that context where there's no pretense. There's no hierarchy, there's no pecking order. Everybody know what their job is, go do it, and have fun doing it. Happy with the success Return of the Killers made us found, Foursquare was content to move on to future film projects without violent veggies, but someone in La La Land wasn't through with the Killers Tomatoes just yet, and knew they were destined for Saturday morning greatness. 
cartoon series was in production at that time. Steve was uh, instrumental in uh, making the deal happen. A lot of that was his vision. Actually, I got to know Margaret Lesh, who was the head of Marvel. That's Margaret Lesh, the head honcho at Marvel Productions when the Killer Tomatoes guest starred in that highly rated Muppet Babies episode. Recognizing the Killer Tomatoes' potential for being a household name among rugrats around the world, she stayed in touch with Peace through the years as Marvel's parent company, New World, worked with Foursquare to make Return of the Killer Tomatoes. We had been approached first by Disney to buy just the title. They wanted to buy Attack of the Killer Tomato title, and then by Hanna-Barbera to do a animated version of Killer Tomatoes. It was natural for me to pick up the phone and call Margaret. Hey, I've got these things, what do you think? Margaret said, don't talk to him. I go, what do you mean don't talk to him? I, I can't even say, no, no, don't talk to them. Just trust me, don't talk to anybody. This went on for a few weeks and then a few months. And and uh, I periodically check in with Margaret. I said, can I talk to them? No, don't talk to them. And then one day I woke up uh, and in fact, this is the pre-internet days and the headline in Variety is Margaret Lesh tapped as president of Fox Children Cartoon Network wasn't even able to get to the point of aha and my phone rang and Margaret said we're going to do killer tomatoes it was it launched the fox children's network and that's how the whole relationship uh, developed in the cartoons which led to the third and fourth movies and the merchandising rights that ensued uh, thereof and really probably ultimately the broadest exposure of the title <laughs> With Hollywood turning all kinds of movie properties into Saturday morning fodder for Rugrats, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes was in a unique position. To translate this campy midnight hit to the small screen, Marvel Productions put their top wordsmith on the job, Richard Mueller. I was head writer of Marvel Productions at that time. It was a strange place to work, very nice, but we had a, we had a great boss, Margaret Lesh, and then she left and we got another boss. Margaret Lynn Fox, and she became head of children's programming there. So we had a direct connection. In animation and any kind of writing for anything, when someone says, can you, and you immediately answer yes. So I sure, I can, I can do Killer Tomatoes. I'd seen, I'd seen parts of the movie and I went back and watched the whole thing. They designed a lot of it based on the characters from the second movie. Um, they felt that that would translate and align nicely to a younger audience. So that was sort of their focus. Springboarding off the characters and events Foursquare created the return of the Killer Tomatoes, the timeline's been reset to five years after the Great Tomato War instead of ten, and Gang Green manages to elude arrest as the FBI's most egregious war criminal, resuming his quest to rule the world with his mutant tomato experiments and psychic Igor from his hometown of San Diego, I mean, San Zucchini. Luckily, the town still has his local pizza parlor heroes to save them from Gang Green's weekly schemes for global takeover, from Tomato War veteran Wilbur Finletter and his Tomato Task Force, to a drastically reimagined Chad, Tara, and Neff T. Well, I can't help but notice that George Clooney's character didn't make the jump to Saturday morning with the rest of the gang. What's up with that? When he was uh, living in North Hollywood, we'd run into him all the time at the market. But I never, I never thought to ask him about that. In terms of writing the episodes, particularly involved early on to, to get it going. But as Marvel took the reins, they had people come on and do that. And as a writer with the biggest pen in the room, Richard wrote his fair share of the first season while helping stir up ideas for scripts as a story editor. I did many, many episodes of the real Ghostbusters. So I had a sense to the absurd. I loved animation that would do something, would go somewhere, action adventure. I'm not not as big on squash and stretch, but you know that's there's a lot of that too going on. I love maps, so I drew a tourist map of San Zucchini, and then we would go back and pull little things off the maps. Let's let's do something about this, which is I think a good shows do that. And that must have come in real handy, too. Episodes feature Jaws parodies off the beach, miles of botanical gardens full of creature from the Black Lagoon gags, campgrounds threatened by tomatoes disguised as mountains, tomato body snatchers taking over the crud news station, it just goes on and on. 
Luckily, there's a Tomato Task Force Hell Keep All the Commotion at Bay, and they're at full strength with disguise expert Sam Smith, a gymnast named Mary Jo replacing Greta, the steroid chomp and swimmer who was taken out by the original tomato threat, and diver Floyd Bridgework, whose name for some odd reason was changed from Greg Colburn in the first two movies, but Tomato Tomato, these fellas are remembered for their occupation, not their names. So with all the freedom animation allows, this must have been a thrilling time for Foursquare to flex the creative muscles like never before and see their wildest ideas come alive without the usual restrictions that come with producing a live action flick. Wasn't directly involved in the production. You're kidding! They wouldn't allow us to write anything. And principally, that's my role as I'm the writer. I submitted lots of them story ideas and they just didn't care. They had their own staff of writers and that's all they were interested in doing. Well, even if you didn't get to play with your own cartoons, you must have enjoyed kicking your boots up and collecting fat checks as the owner of the Killage Motors property. You may think, wow, that guy must have made an awful lot of money. No, that's why I drove here in my Honda and I wasn't driven here by a chauffeur in a Rolls Royce. Well, I wish we could have just kicked back, but you know, the checks weren't big enough. We still had to make a living doing other things. Well, we're not gonna learn how to be multimillionaires in independent filmmaking, because I haven't figured that out either. We stayed in San Diego. Realistically, if you're gonna be in the business, you gotta be where the business is. It's not as true today as it was then. I'm in the legislature, so I'm, I had very limited physical involvement other than putting the deals together. The actual execution and production was overseen by Margaret, and she had more inter interplay with John in that period of time. We felt that in an executive producer role, we could still have input. We, tr we trusted the, uh, the resources that, that did it. We technically had veto power with in terms of creative content, but we also were entirely aware of the fact we had no clue what we were doing. It didn't bother me. I, I had sort of let go creatively at that point. It was like, uh, show me the ratings and let's see what we do on the numbers and how's that gonna, you know, uh, help us moving the property forward. Then I take it it was Marvel's decision to give Gang Green these pipsqueak tomatoes for minions as opposed to the big kahunas I really wanted to see in action? Well, you remember the beginning where they're all, hundreds of them are flooding across the screen. You can't do that with huge tomatoes. It gave us, you know, gave us a little more control. You can pick one up and throw it. You can kick it. I think they work better that way. That became that gang of five as opposed to huge things that blot out red across the screen. When they decided to make the tomatoes have faces and teeth and so forth, from my perspective, that takes some of the joke out of it. The whole, the whole joke of tomatoes is how can they be dangerous? They're tomatoes. Why don't you give them teeth and stuff? Well, they are dangerous. That humorous element is gone. They didn't, really didn't seem to get the concept of killer tomatoes being an, a vehicle to make fun of something else. They just played it too straightforward of a standard kids horror movie, so to speak. I wanted it to be more like, you know, Rocky and Bowwinkle, <laughs> uh, where adults would watch it and, and, and catch something that kids were getting and vice versa. Because all, all of our films, we try to write it so that kids like something and adults like something. And I just felt like the cartoon show, they were doing their thing. Despite all that drama, as a fan of the Killer Tomatoes, I say Richard and the gang and Marvel Productions did a bang up job of the property. Even if they took the series more at face value, they still respected the hell out of the material and kept a lot of the gags from the movie running while expanding the lore. Case in point, while Terra's relationship with Chad was radically changed with him being de-aged to a relatable youngin for the target demographic at home, I guess, she's more or less the same. It was clearly me, you know, with the hair and... The outfits, I mean, they took it from Tara's wardrobe and played on it a little bit. Returning her to someone who flip-flops between gal and tomato, her musical trigger for the transformation is swapped for something less copyright protected, like salt and pepper causing her change, and her glowing eye effect is developed into a full-blown superpower that's like a six tomato sense, allowing her to do things with her mind. But of all these developments, the one burning question about Tara that Richard and the gang decide to tackle in the cartoon's first episode, no less, I, using just six milk bottles and a tuning fork, have discovered how to drive tomatoes into a frenzy! <laughs> huh. It's not quite what I expected, but, uh, but hey, at least they finally gave fans a bit of that carrot revolt we've been waiting for. Even the tomato's origin as a mutant threat is finally explained in Tomato Evasion from Mars, where it's revealed Gain Green grew them from tomato seeds exposed to cosmic radiation on a secret NASA space mission. 
But the more things change, the more they stay the same. Just like in Return of the Killer Tomatoes, Finn Letter's Maidalist Pizza Parlor continues to whip up some of the craziest pizza pies since the Ninja Turtles cartoon. Our special today is our chocolate malted and french fry pizza. Mayonnaise and red snapper. Spumani pizza? My first Tex-Mex pizza. Kung Pao jalapenos and hot sauce. Pumpkin and candy corn. I liked it better last week when you had hot frozen pizza sundaes, especially the butterscotch and anchovies. Instant leftover pizzas. They already have a slice out of them. Chocolate covered cherries, cucumbers, and cinnamon sticks. We used to have a sign in my office there that said, uh, we're not doing Shakespeare here. And that was pretty much the uh, background of Killer Tomatoes. And it wasn't a highly scripted show, but we did have good scripts. We'd take anything possible and run with it. Uh, you know, we had an Elvis Presley episode. There was a Star Trek episode. Anything we could walk off with and not get caught, we'd put it in the show. Wasn't John's characters, he had the same last name, but he had a different first name. That's right! In the Killer Tomato movies, his name is Professor Mortimer Gangrene, but here his name is changed to Dr. Putrid Gangrene. We loved John, and we wanted John to be part of it, and I'm sure the studio did too. At that time, I was sort of uh, doing voice stuff regularly. I was delighted when I heard they were going to do it, and even more tickled when I met all the voice actors who were on that show. One of the first voice actors on board was stand-up comic turned vocal powerhouse with his first big break playing Egon Spangler on the hit tune The Real Ghostbusters, Maurice LaMarche. Uh, it came to me the way most of my work comes to me, through, through, the, uh, through the audition process. Back then, you went to Wally Burr Recording Studios and they had you know, piles of the copy of the various characters and sometimes you would pick who you felt like reading for. I remember reading for Zoltan. I was a big fan of Taxi in those days, so I just kind of did my, my Louis De Palma impression, you know? And I remember uh, reading for Tomato Guy. Uh, he just looked like Woody Allen to me, and I thought I'd do a good Woody Allen. <laughs> Tomato! I was surprised that I got the, you know, the job because I was just doing these stock impressions. As the first batch of vile veggies farmed by Gang Green, the Gang of Five are supposed to be subjected to learning tapes during their vegetative state, but Igor accidentally exposes them to a collection of late night movies. Let's give this sleepy burger a taste of what's in store. Shaken, not stirred, of course. Ooh, you dirty rat. You're asking for it. Sorry, we didn't order any pizza. All the pressing plants in all the cities of the world, she had to walk in the mine. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? We're in business now, see? Nah. That's right, see? Nah, nah. How do you approach a character imitating other characters? Were, were you asked to do impressions in Zoltan's voice at first? I think we just decided that Zoltan was a good impressionist because uh, we, we, we didn't want to do, you know, to filter all those characters through Zoltan's gravel and this kind of New York accent. We, it wasn't working. It was like a double conceit. So we just decided that Zoltan really did voices really well because we tried it the other way and it just wasn't working. It was a joke on a joke. But I began to do things that weren't just archetypes, that were impressions. The first time where I was doing something different with my voice, they just said, you know, a Texas accent or something like that. And I must warn you, I played in a lot of old war movies. And then the writers just went, great, we'll just have you do impress." And so, you know, it, it came about slowly, but uh, that's one of those things that it's like, it's a, there's a give take, it's a symbiosis. You start working with voice people, and the first episode that they're recording, you may be writing in the six or seven. Two extremely gullible and naive parents. <laughs> Caught forever in a web of bull doo doo. But on all the worlds, circling all the suns, in all the universes, we have yet to find any trace of intelligent vegetable life. Let's face it, this Wilbur Finn letter is no Pacino. And the style, it looks like a cartoon. Oh, this place is filled with garbage. Exactly, Captain, because we are in a garbage compactor. We're about to become condensed waste. This is Igor Smith here at the secret laboratory of Dr. P. Yitri T. Gangrene. Igor was especially fun because uh, he was just such a doofus. While John Aston and Steve Peace's cartoon counterparts more or less resembled them from Return of the Killer Tomatoes, it was Steve Lundquist's doodle of a doppelganger who came the closest to catching his likeness. 
I had no idea it was even on. Somebody goes, oh, we, I saw Killer Tomatoes cartoon. I said, oh, good. They probably knew that, that with my southern accent, somebody would understand me. And, and they they probably get every take right at first, and then take me 20 takes, and they go broke on the budget. Oh, come on. Look me in the sockets and tell me you wouldn't have jumped at the chance of being a cartoon. Oh, I would definitely work with John again. He's just such a good guy. Come on. He's a legend. He's just fun and nice and giving as an actor, giving as a person. Uh, who, can, who can ask for any better? Yeah, that must have been weird for John having someone else play Igor after developing his rapport and returning the Killer Tomatoes with you. It was weird. I had uh, sort of come to rely on Steve. I just liked him and felt very comfortable with him there. So I had to learn it all over again when he was replaced. Well, if you have to be replaced with someone, at least it was with a talent off a hot show like the Ninja Turtles. The voice for Igor was actually in the Ninja Turtles. When they hired Townsend Coleman and, and, and me, they didn't know who was going to be Leonardo and who was going to be Michelangelo. I'm from L.A., so I am ground zero for this voice, because kids at my school is a surf school. They tossed a coin, and they said, uh, okay, Tony, you're Michelangelo, and Cam, you're Leo. So I was determined that there would be my opportunity to use this voice in some show. Ready, set, serve! Take that, Townsend Coleman! Very cool. So, so I'm, I'm related to a turtle and a tomato. This is Whitley White with the KRUD TV News Bulletin. Whitley White is the local broadcaster, and he's on every radio station, every television station, even to the point where he's in the studio at the television station and throws it to himself in the field. Back to the news. Obviously, White's inspired by the reporter from Return of the Killer Tomatoes. John is one of the executive producers. You ever push a reprises role in the cartoon? I never thought of that. Uh, that would have been fun. I had George Putnam in mind most of the time. I would be this close to cracking up 90% of the time while I was doing these lines. I just found the whole thing hilarious. Uh, Mr. Timer, or may I call you old? Thank you, Whitley. I knew that the, the, the characters were being changed for the younger demo, that they were going to be significantly different just because of the marketing and, and the direction of the series. Well, how about you, Peace? Were you ever given a chance to voice yourself? From a practical perspective, I couldn't. I, I could say I was in the legislature. It just would have been a time demand I, I could not do. And we weren't allowed to do anything in the production, you know? I went down watched them do the voices, you know, went to the studio and stuff, and I've been happy to be a cartoon voice. I didn't get to do me. <laughs> the first time I was ever in a recording studio was on an episode of uh, Ghostbusters, and then several times with Killer Tomatoes. Whenever I was free, I was down there, whether it was my script or not, because that was my responsibility. There was a nice little uh, sound studio up on Hollywood Way. Stu Rosen I, was our director. We all got along very well. We always recorded ensemble. That was the fun part. That was the fun of it. In those days, if you blew a take, you know, or whatever, you got to, you'd do for a, go for a three-page run, and then the director would want to reset and, and talk to the writers. Was that good? Was that, did we did it give you what we wanted? While that was happening, we would just start a conversation, and it was great. It was a real family feeling, and and everybody enjoyed each other. Recording the voice. Uh, that's a different activity which I'm not crazy about because uh, it's kind of overdoing it. I prefer uh, to have a subtler note in there. Uh, but that, that's, that's okay. I, uh, it worked for the, uh, for the cartoon. It was great working with John because I could pick his brain about things like West Side Story and Adam's Family and things like that. He always brought in a little, a little tiny uh, valise, about this big. And in it, he had all of his different fright wigs for all the different shows he did. He had to, he'd put on these future T. Grand Green fright wig. We'd all, you know, we'd off and run. <laughs> okay. You know, he kind of is a wild and crazy guy. So it was like, oh, it's wig day. Okay, uh, roll him. <laughs> I think he did that once. I don't know if he did that every time. He had a wonderful sense of humor, it still does. I love working with John. I mean, I couldn't believe I was working with this legend from the early days of television and that he was starting to consider me his friend. I was just like, wow, John Aston, that Gomez. And his instincts were so right on. I mean, there was no, was that funny enough that I hit the, 
the beat, you know, the comedy beat, right? That John just, it just, it just fell out of him, you know? And, and he's, you know, because he's so, so experienced and so wonderful. Yeah, great guy. Maurice and I have the same birthday, and so we always try to call each other. We've only missed maybe two years. We've made it a tradition to call. One calls the other on our birthday. And up until, I mean, even as recently as last year. You know. <laughs> Relax, F.T. I'm just going for a swim. Well, we made sure that Tara got voted the sexiest animated character that year. We had a lot of fun with her. How about that little kiss, Booby? God, I love Kat's voice. Got one of the most adorable voices. I guess because I'm sort of a special kind of girl, kind of partial to tomatoes. Ah, uh, Kath. She throws herself into her character. She really is that, you know? The real Kath is very independent, doesn't play games. But when it's called on in the script, she does it extremely well and talented, really talented. She was the second Janine on, on Real Ghostbusters. So when we moved on to this show, but, oh, good, Kath's, Kath's there. Because, you know, you want to develop a family feel with people that you're working with. You know? I haven't had a decent game since a couple of 49ers wandered in here by accident. Miners looking for gold? Uh, football players looking for a pass. Well, that would be, of course, my, my hackneyed and well-worn James Mason impression. So, yes, he was based on James Mason, the great actor from the 1950s. All of us are fascinated by this recording of uh, the engineers giving Orson Welles a hard time on a commercial. We know a remote farm in Lincolnshire where Mrs. Buckley lives. Every July, peas grow there. Do you really mean that? I think it sounds a bit in, in July. Why? That doesn't make any sense. Get me a jury and show me how you can say in July and I'll go down on you. Hearing Wells get angry. It was quite an event, actually. Maurice wanted to do Orson Welles. He would read lines from that dialogue. Yeah, started being obnoxious with the voice uh, on that show. You know, whenever there was a lull, I just started with, we know a remote farm in Lincolnshire. And, you know, I just do the whole frozen peas outtake. And, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't stop me because I think there was, a, it's kind of that, you know, that thing of where you, can't stop staring at a traffic accident. He always wanted to use that voice in something. So when Pinky and the Brain came up, Maurice did Wells' voice for the Brain. Yes. I was tickled. It was always fun to do those shows. <laughs> yeah. Say, that's pretty good. I think I'll do gangrene for the rest of the episode. I actually figured out I could do John right there in those sections. <laughs> Hurry up, Igor. I have a date with destiny. Yeah. I think they did it so they could watch me mess with John. Who writes this stuff? Richard Mueller? They didn't tell me they did that until I saw it later on in the finish. We used almost everybody in the studio as a character one time or another. Avery Coburn was the censor over at Fox. And a lovely woman, really nice. And we put her in the show as the censor lady. She'd run out and say, no, no, no. No biting and no blood. Not on a cartoon show. How can I be a vampire if I cannot bite your neck? What am I supposed to do? Kiss it? Yeah, kissing is nice. The three writers, we became henchmen on the henchman's bus going to the henchman convention. So everybody got a chance to, you know, to play, so to speak. We had one executive over there, Sydney I want her, funny guy. He would always come over to the studio and try to get us to change things. And we finally said, look, we'll put you in an episode if you leave us alone. So he would he became Sydney I gotcha. Whoa! You based Gang Green's greatest rival on him? A competing scientist who not only created an army of killer potatoes, but is responsible for Gang Green's obsession after tormenting him with tomatoes through his power hungry childhood? You really must have wanted them to go away. He loved it. It was fun. You know, everything we did was fun. There was no, uh, no problem. He was sure he was going to be a toy. It was all well paid silliness, is what it amounts to. I think there's more respect in animation than there is in live action. 
found out later on that the show was a huge hit in London. And the cartoon show was a hit, and so they were willing to finance a couple more movies. <laughs> After teasing us with carrot carnage for over a decade, Foursquare completely nixes the idea of veggie on veggie violence for a more subtle comedy about the enslavement of mankind. Rather than an all out assault on the free world and killers made a strike back, Professor Gain Green and his henchman Igor return with a more subliminal approach for world domination with a talk show for brainwashing couch potatoes into helpless idiot box zombies. With his carnivorous creations chomping at the bit for total takeover, the killer tomatoes get a little carried away with their meals and call the unwanted attention of a cynical man child detective. With the help of a beautiful tomatologist believing one bad tomato doesn't spoil the bunch, it's a race to cancel Gang Green Civil Broadcast before they end up some tomatoes lunch on a dead meat sandwich. We did that one, you know, fairly quickly. We had a, a, a time frame that we wanted to, to get that out to sort of align with the cartoon series. Every Killer Tomato movie is different. We said, hey, let's let's try a different character. Um, let's have some fun with this. And who better to bring that fun than Rick Rockwell, a stand-up comic who worked double time to impress Foursquare in Return of the Killer Tomatoes. John came to me and asked me if I would do it. Probably took me three milliseconds to say yes. And uh, that was that. We thought we'd take a shot and, uh, and give him some freedom and see what would happen. I co-wrote it with Costa. Many, many writing sessions at uh, my place, and we get together and, and spend all day and then go out and get something to eat and then go back and get right at it. And uh, it, it, it was fun. Cost is fun to work with. Uh, originally, what we wanted to do was Killer Tomatoes in Space, which I still have, because <laughs> uh, that's what I had written. And I don't remember why we didn't do it. Either it was too expensive or that's not what Fox wanted. I don't know. Because Rick Brockwell was my principal co-writer around that. A lot of that was Rick. Uh, Rick just had a different perspective on the humor than I did. I think this was John DeBello's analysis was that I'm more of a line guy and Costa was more of a visual gag guy. When you're working with a writing partner, you make compromises of which the director eventually makes the decision. John pretty much gave me enough rope to hang myself, shall we say. Well, surely you did your homework with help from the boys in blue. Did you prepare for the role as a soft-boiled detective with ride-alongs or something? Just uh, watching cop shows on TV. I kind of wanted to be the anti-cop. I don't think you're going to find too many cops that had a ball on a rubber string and a paddle, right? So I wanted it to be campy and, and different. There was nothing in there uh, to me about trying to reprise what an actual cop would do. <laughs> To me, it was all just how funny and how uh, ridiculous can we make this. A worthy opponent is a lot of fun. The tougher they are, the better I like them. <laughs> I had spent a lot of time with John doing the casting. I kept insisting, I said to John, Develo, I said, that guy Clooney has something. You know, he's really good. Why, why don't you uh, cast him in the next film? Thank goodness he was either wasn't available or they didn't ask him or thought he was out of their budget because then I got to do it. So with Foursquare's latest veggie squash and hero checked off their to-do list, they left the gang with casting the newest heartthrob of the series. Oh, that wealthy looking man in the corner is going to sue you. For what? I'm not sure, but I think he's going to sue you for money. <laughs> Crystal, is, she was awesome. My favorite moment of Crystal may have been the very first uh, time she came in to audition, because we probably read 50 or 60 actresses that had been submitted for that role. Everybody held up a card with a number on it. And uh, right there in her first uh, interview, she said, hello, my name is Crystal Carson. She held up her card, it was 10. She said, I am a 10. And then she commenced. And I thought that kind of confidence, she's great. She was a 10. I mean, she's funny, she's witty, she's pretty. She did a, a, a very good job and just a nice person and a total pro. That was that was a total winner. That was that was the right pick. My manager at the time was talking to him about I had pilots that I had booked for sitcoms and one of them we shot it and then the producer had a heart attack and died. So it went back off the air. That was supposed to be a spin-off of uh, Charles in Charge. So I said, I want to do comedy. I want to find some comedy. 
because that was so much fun. And I'd been auditioning for so many dramas. And he said, okay, well, do you want to go out for Killer Tomatoes? And I was like, are you serious? Is that a thing? So I went and I watched it and I was like, yeah, that just looks like so much fun. And he said, yeah, it shoots in San Diego. I'm like, oh, my brother lives in San Diego and that'll be a blast. And Rick was a five-year-old in adult pants. <laughs> and I knew right away he needed a babysitter. So I just started, you know, bossing him around and having fun. And I guess we had some kind of chemistry because I got the part. <laughs> I think it's time we pop this boil. <gasps> no! You know, John Aston, you're working with an icon and you get paid to show up and hang out and do a scene with John Aston. To be working beside him was something that I, you know, never in my wildest dreams. Just the ultimate professional. He was always on time, knew his lines, didn't mess around too much off camera, wasn't a fuddy-duddy at all, but kept us moving. I would say he, he was really helpful to keeping us on time and just the smartest guy. He's incredible vocabulary. He liked the character. He thought it was fun. And we certainly liked working with him. I think he enjoyed the fact that it was kid friendly. And I think he just enjoyed the fact that there were fun movies to do. So easy to get along with, so easy going that he put everybody around him at ease. Here are those overnight ratings, Dr. Gangrene. I told you never to call me that. I'm sorry, Geronimo. Not Geronimo. Geronimo Hugh. Hugh Downs. Hugh Hefner. Hugh Mungus. Excuse me, Geronimo Hugh. Interest. Well, you know, you figure that, that, that John and I, I guess, you know, the henchmen and the whole deal, I guess they wanted to keep the joke running. Uh, uh, obviously, my calendar was not full uh, in, the, in the movies I was doing or not doing. Oh, he likes choo-choo trains. The sleeping car. It's a one-way ticket to terror. So it was easy enough to say, yeah, I'll do this. So you just get back into character, old friends, you know, shaking hands. It was really that easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, you can laugh. <laughs> Long quest with that cheesy, ass fake grin of his all you'd have to do is just get, flash me that smile and i'm putty in his hands he's really a uh, one of a kind he's just the nicest most honest trustworthy funny guy you could ever meet if you ever need to talk to somebody and want what you say to go nowhere steve if you ever need advice and you want somebody who won't judge you Steve. And if you ever just want to go kick around and have fun and still know that somebody will take care of you, Steve. <laughs> He's amazing. A surprisingly darker tone, this flick doesn't just start with the killer's made of striking back, they make mincemeat in the opening act! And she's running through the woods and the trees are ripping off her clothes as she goes. The killer tomato with the chainsaws. I mean, we're just having fun with the, the whole R-rated horror genre. I don't know that the blood was as much of an issue as just the gag, the takeoff on horror movies. Boy, that hockey's a rough sport. He stinks too. Smell like my granddaddy. Now, I had a bunch of comedic friends, uh, most notably John Witherspoon, who played my co-detective. I used to be so frightened when the police don't stop me, man, but it's the best feeling in the world when you know you haven't had a drink in 10 days. Just come from dinner with a big plate of food full of garlic. <laughs> this man wants to smell my breath. Ha! <laughs> His nickname is Spoon, and that's what everybody at the comedy store called him. He was terrific. He's a great guy. He was a great actor, very funny. Those two guys could riff off each other and then get John DeBella going. And, you know, we could waste a day with them just zinging off of each other. It doesn't get any better than that. He's just a great guy. We used to tease him because he was ha hanging out all the time. So, so Rick was always trying to figure out how to bring him onto the set. Like, let's throw in some lines. Let's give him this and that. But we never could because he couldn't stop himself from swearing. <laughs> so he would joke all the time that he would have a bigger role. He didn't have to say it, you know mother effer all the time <laughs> and it was such a pg sweet film and here's 
you know, Rick, and he's like a five-year-old and it's, everything is very sweet and innocent. And then he would walk over to John and the two of them would just potty mouth it. It would be like, wow. And then the cameras would roll and they, and he bounce around like this sweetheart again. <laughs> oh, Rick. Oh, Rick. <laughs> he's just awesome, dude. <laughs> Man, didn't y'all feel under the gun to deliver a flick as good as the last one while knowing the whole franchise was about to become a Saturday morning phenomenon? If anything, it might have been a little looser because the pressure was off. It's not like we had arrived. It's We're getting funding for this thing, right? And it wasn't like everybody was like, oh, now we got money, we're going to waste it, you know, like the U.S. government. We were on such tight budgets that I wouldn't have wanted to actually eat at craft services because it would be costing me money. <laughs> We were always under the gun as far as time went and trying to get things done before the sun set. We only have this location for a day. We've got to get this shot. We would start the day off saying, we have too many pages to shoot. So we've really got to buckle down today, guys. Let's not mess around too much. And then we messed around and we made it. <laughs> I mean, everybody knew we had to get this in. We had a time frame. We had a budget. I think that little bit of success was just kind of a a breathing room confidence. Okay, we're doing the right thing here. We're on the right track, obviously. This has been well received. Good. You know, let's let's just keep doing this. On a side note, I gotta commend whoever's responsible for Candidate's Tomatology Lab for studying killer veggies. This set is top shelf. If I were to design this set, this is exactly what I pictured. They did a great job. Ah, uh, tomato murders. The kind of sick, senseless violence that makes a cat want to have his guts ripped out and turned into racket strings to be used by McEnroe while he belittles chair umpires. Wilbur's re... you see his screen time diminish each time. John will tell you it's because the acting was poor. Uh, it was actually because they couldn't afford me. I got so good that, uh, you know, I, w I had to command higher rates and I couldn't diminish my marketability by, you know, giving them a hometown discount. So the, the compromise was I had less screen time. Nauseating, incorrigible, odious, loathsome, repulsive, hideous, contemptible, no, antisocial. Uh... That's it. There's one thing that I would have done over. I didn't appreciate the fact that, you know, these are special people and great opportunities to just know people on a human being level. I didn't spend a lot of the time on the set other than when I was at scenes. I'd go in, shoot it, and literally leave the set. And because I was doing the things you do to keep, you know, the next day ready to go and staying away from the set, I actually spent a lot less time with the actors or Aston or any of these guys than either Costa or John would have. At least you had your emotional support tomato with you. <laughs> well, the puppet was particularly inspiring. Speaking of puppets, this flick really steps up his game to finally meet fans' expectations seen all over the posters. The fellow responsible for this cinematic achievement in putrid hand drama, Andrew Johnson. This was your first movie as a special effects guy, that right? Correct. That was the first one I did. I grew up in San Diego. My love and my passion was always directing and writing, and I knew I had to get to Los Angeles to do that. And one skill that I had was special effects makeup and special effects that I had kind of just taught myself as a kid. I had moved to Los Angeles in the late 80s and started working in the special effects industry. I sought out some of the shops up here. But this I did on my own, and to be honest with you, I have no recollection of how that came to be. I remember, you know, in a little apartment in Van Nuys working on, you know, sculpting these tomatoes and mechanizing them. The killer tomatoes were audio animatronic puppets to some extent. They weren't the characters from cartoons yet because it was too early in the process. They hadn't been developed yet. I just created this little guy with, with teeth, with kind of sharp teeth and big eyes. And they had to hold a lot of props. So that was one thing, you know, I had to figure that out. So I just kind of extended the vines and made them into to arms where they could hold little machine guns. Yeah, those things, you know how that goes. You, know, you have 10 people operating a mouth, you know, stuff like that. And, and you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, it, you know that's early ages of animatronics. And we did a lot of them too. It's the Strike Back puppets were a little smaller and kind of large grapefruit size. I like that, yeah. Actually, I can go either way. As someone that's watching the movie, I thought it was fun because it was new and it was different. And we always try to do something different in each of the movies. As a director, it's a total pain. I, I said I didn't like it. <laughs>
just didn't like the idea of tomatoes actually being real characters. It kind of bothered me. Interestingly enough, you go back at the original poster, which is, you know, actually in the industry is considered to be one of the best movie posters of any movie ever in history. Despite the fact that it does not in any way reflect what's in the movie, that's the birth of the killer tomatoes with teeth. It's in the original one sheet to the original movie. Both Costa and I share the affliction of believing in the purity of tomatoes as a species without teeth. So we, we have been consistently uh, overruled, first by a rogue artist drawing a one sheet. I, I blame the one sheet from the original for the evolution of the uh, tomatoes going forward. Do you really believe Tinsy winsy tomatoes are dangerous. Now, both Costa and I have spent a lot of time in public service, and we feel uh, an obligation for people to understand the threat that tomatoes can potentially be in the everyday household. And when you diminish it by putting all this artwork that is a pure fantasy, how's a person to know when, when they're actually potentially under serious threat? Well, I'm sure all the creepy music heard whenever a killer tomatoes around is a dead giveaway. A mix of parody notes from Jaws to Psycho. This sequel soundtrack is a true myriad of emotional twists and turns thanks to the returning maestros from the last sequel. Rick came to me and said, they're offering him another sequel. Do you want to do it? And I was crazy enough to say, sure. You know, what the hell? The last one was fun and there was enough time between that I had some sleep. I don't know if they tried getting somebody cheaper. Uh, <laughs> if, they <laughs> probably couldn't do it. <laughs> I know we pretty much split the work in half. So I was doing, I know it, I did at least half of the scoring. Rick studied film scores. I mean, he would just have hundreds and hundreds of CDs and scores, you know, the, the written music for the score, so he could listen to it and it would have a score in front of him so he could see what the composer actually did to get that sound and that effect. So he was brilliant in that aspect. He could emulate, even, even on a small budget, you know, of course, if you use synthesizers and samples the right way, you know, a few live instruments as well. He knew how to, how to go from one field to another. All my synthesizers were in a home studio, in a condo. And uh, so we used that for the, for the synth and for, for various sweetening and anything we didn't do on an outside studio. Rick wrote this scene, which required us to have a little small choir chanting uh, this devil worship stuff. Ave Santari, Ave Linguini. Ave Santari, Ave Linguini. And it was 2 a.m. in the morning in my condo. And uh, we, had, we had, I don't know, about five or six of us around the microphone singing. And I was thinking any minute I'm going to hear the police sirens coming up because there was another person on the other side of the condo you know, sleeping at 2 a.m., wondering what we were doing. And uh, that was kind of interesting, but luckily we got away with it. I love the scene, and it was one of the most fun to shoot other than um, flashing everybody. I just remember having to at attach these tomatoes, you know, to her breasts. There was an idea that the tomatoes would attack my boobs because, like I said, we were kind of a, you know, PG or G rated film, really. So to shoot there, we thought it'd be funny to have two big tomato boobs, like they jumped on me and I don't, who knows what. You always just get odd requests like that when you do special effects, and then you got to figure out how to do it. So here he is uh, trying to discreetly get this fishing line hooked through a bra to a tomato that's down in the bottom of the tub, and so that he could pull it off camera and the things would <laughs> you know, fly up and hook. But every time they flew up, the bra wouldn't stay on. So there was a little bit of a problem that they would, and then boom. <laughs> and it was like, ah, okay, that's not gonna work. And so we would re-rig it somewhere else and then he would pull and it would, you know, pull the boobs off to some other direction. And we were moving, like we were filming fast. And so when it wouldn't work, we would shoot a piece while he went off and tried to make something else work and then come back and, and try a whole new gig with it. And it was getting to be really annoying because, you know, there's a crew there and my top kept coming off. 
<laughs> so I, I think I'm the one that pulled the plug on that gag. Well, at least you got to recycle that boob gag for a later scenes so it didn't go to waste. Yeah, I do have a recollection of her just laying down and me trying to figure out how to attach these things so they would actually stay up. She's in this little flimsy, you know, nightgown type thing, and it's like we've got these kind of relatively heavy puppets. What's wrong, What's wrong Mr. Oh, there was another song they took from a musical I wrote, which I just gave him permission to use, called What's Wrong, Mr. Anchorman, from a musical I wrote called Meat Streets. Charles White! Hey, fella, long time no see. Betty! Will he make it? Will he make it? Bet he won't. Bet he makes it. When was the last time? Oh, I remember it was when that train demolished that school bus, wasn't it? No, no, it was the mass poisoning at the old folks' home. <laughs> and John DiBello, when he was doing his newscaster, is really a great character for him because he plays that role just perfectly. I always loved working with him when he was doing that. Every day on the set, he would eat a roast beef sandwich with tomatoes. Like, who can eat the same thing every day? But he said he was too busy to think about what he wanted to eat. So every day, roast beef sandwich. Like, he is so focused on working that everything else is set up to be automatic and he never has to think about it. So he can 100% think about whatever movie project he's doing. That's dedication. We shot in the most beautiful places. We closed down the zoo and got to walk around and see the animals. Today, we have a very special treat. Please welcome our surprise celebrity guest, the world famous F.T. F.T. is very sweet. He's just like a fluff ball. Built one that he was maybe volleyball sized. People could just carry around. That was just a dummy's. We built a mechanical one. He just had a little cable controlled mouth. And then I think I put a little cable control on, on his lead so they could move around and, and be a little bit expressive. But I was always operating him in very bizarre places. I remember on one of them just we were, it was a platform and they, they screwed me into it. It was like a coffin type thing and they put a lid on it and they screwed it shut. And I have, you know, a little uh, walkie talkie to communicate with people with, but I'm, you know, th there's always that great fear as a puppeteer that they leave you. They forget that you're closed into a box that actually needs a screw gun to get you out and they go to lunch or something, you know? But that was always tough. Nice legs, detective. Do you have any accessories to go with this? Maybe some pumps, a nice necklace? <laughs> and my other favorite is the uh, scene on the sofa with Crystal Carson. She's pouring her heart out to me and, and giving me intimate details of her life. I wanted to be a dancer. Topless? Ballet. Oh, right. So, uh, you know, I got her into a stripper role there. So that, that, was, that was really a fun moment. We just played our parts off camera. So it was really fun to always sort of nanny him around and wish that he would love me. And then, no, you know, <laughs> it was just fun. Rick was always, you know, acting up. Uh, he had, he, he, you know, he's being a comedian. So he always had one-liners. No, 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 you fell down and you can't act. So you just start cracking up with him. And those pants he used to wear, he'd always wear those. I'm like, dude, really? But hey, that was his shtick. Rick was the kind of person you had to say, yeah, that's a great idea, Rick, we're gonna do it this way. <laughs> that's some holiday that went by or a birthday or something. And there was a can of whipped cream by um, some pies. And, you know, he was doing the nastiest stuff with the whipped cream and then, we got a roll, he'd wipe it off, and then he was just this kid, you know, eating it off. So, so that was surreal. <laughs> I'd probably be more of a Saturday Night Live type guy, where I could reprise the same thing, do a five minute bit, and then we're out, commercial, audience applause sign. You know, that's that probably would be me rather than what I did in that movie by going from start to finish and uh, playing the same character. Most notably, I was closer with was Kevin West, who played the uh, crazy bank teller. You are calling me Mr. Potato Head, aren't you, Chick? <laughs> yes, you are. So well, I'll show you, Mr. Potato Head. This is Mr. Potato Head. No, I'm calling you the teller who's being robbed and then held hostage. Oh my gosh, that's a funny scene. I was doing stand-up and uh, I was opening for Rick at different places. He was just a huge fan. Everything that's done it, that I do in that movie is from my act. 
except for I think later maybe the zombie self where I was just, you know, doing a character. Because I was I was acting at that point. I was kind of recognizable from Little Caesar Pizza. What's that? A pterodactyl. Kevin West is great. There's only one Kevin West. And uh, he's a unique character. And uh, we like to populate our movies with memorable characters. And Kevin definitely was. <laughs> Why did we pick this up? Kevin West, for me, is the funniest thing in that whole movie. You know, the way he can talk and seem like a puppet, like a Muppet, like he can make his jaw, uh, 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 and he's got like this thin head, you know, and he did his hair so crazy. I just wish he was in the movie more. He was hysterical. They rented a Rolls Royce to do the scene with, and Steve Lundquist uh, and John Aston were going undercover as surfers. This was the big budget breaker in the movie, is they rented a Rolls Royce to, to do this getaway. That was shot on a sidewalk. I don't know if you know where it was shot. It was some bank in downtown or whatever. I mean, it's a real location in San Diego. And in the process of getting into the Rolls Royce, I think it was Steve Lundquist that ran the surfboard into the side of the Rolls Royce. No, John had the surfboard. Uh, as I recall, you don't give him memory so bad. Uh, I think it was John. We just looked at each other. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's probably more, more than our budget. <laughs> I think that happened during a rehearsal for him or he was doing one of those, we were walking through it. It was a rental car on a movie set, it cost some money and this, just fucking the thing and like I'm staying out of it because you know you get the, the transportation person coming over the person that's wrangling the car so there was some um, uh, repercussions from that must have been hard for Foursquare to swallow that bill no, I didn't know about it <laughs> now, you know see I'm the producer I'm the guy they want to keep that information from and they apparently succeeded damn well <laughs> A local guy, he's actually, he was also the caterer. He owns a catering company and a limousine company. And the Rolls is part of his limousine business. <laughs> you know what I like to do for fun? I like to drive around the city and collect all the dead cats I can find. Take them home and, oh, I don't know, put them in a circle. And for a few precious moments, I am the leader. We joke that's called Circle of Dead Cats. It was a bit that I came up with years ago in my early days that was one of my killer, was the one that really, really did well. And it was one of my favorite bits of any stand-up I had ever seen. And so I wrote it into the movie and told uh, John and, and uh, Steve and Costa that this, this is the guy that has to do it. I like the reaction, by the way, to that. John Aston and Steve Lundquist, and when they look at each other and give it that, this guy is freaking crazy, look, was again, probably one of the best moments in the whole film. That it was so genuine and it came across just beautifully. I am the leader! Where do you think on the remote chance that there are such things as killer tomatoes in the world today that a detective might go to find information to crack this case? Try to slip in. As for Sam Smith, they're in my place. The tomatoes in the bar, they fascinated me because they all had their little personalities. The bar was fun. I, I, that's what I still just remember was doing, doing that bar scene. That was a lot of fun. We had a lot of background ones. We had to make a whole bunch of just kind of polyfoam dummies just to be everywhere. These guys, you could tell who was in charge and who was the yes man, and some of them wanted, you know, wanted to be tougher than the other tomato, and one of them, you know, was always lifting up his, oh, was, you know, lifted up his. <laughs> I was amazed by them. That little tomato was too small to be a hand puppet. He was packed full of batteries and servos, and and I mean, just absolutely everything was crammed into this little small space. So. He was actually more of a technological wonder. I mean, he was still so low tech. He was all just remote control that could that could pivot. I could stick it anywhere, stick it on a bar top, anywhere they needed, because these were all practical sets. So it had the, the big moving eyes and blinking eyes and could snarl and open its mouth and, and then and pivot its body. 
and that was you know a radio control thing. So that was kind of the extent of what we built, just the one mechanical one that just got used over and over and over. We just kind of reconfigure the vines and, and you know put a different outfit on it and just be a different puppet. They were my favorite. Don't tell FT. Taken hostage by Gang Green, Kennedy is subjected to an ironic fate as she's served to the very veggies she defended in what's arguably the most controversial scene of all Caleb Man's history. Yeah, I remember John DeBello hated mayonnaise, and so we were so surprised that we thought he was going to say hold the mayo and not do it. But then there was apparently, I don't know, I mean, luckily for the guys with the fetishes, we put the mayonnaise on. <laughs> I was getting fan mail at General Hospital and opened up one of the pieces of fan mail, and it was kind of rotten um, lettuce and tomato and bread. And I had no idea, because I was on a different show, what that was about. And then found the piece of paper with a picture of me be made into a sandwich. And lots of um, innuendo, we'll say. So so now I'm a food fetish. You know, there's a kink for everything. Uh <laughs> and I thought it was sort of a one-off, but since then, I've gotten a, a lot of mail with close-ups <laughs> of different body parts tied up and I can see that I'm laying on a bed of lettuce, um, uh, guys taking pictures of themselves with body parts in a sandwich. <laughs> I don't think I thought of it that directly. We're more worried about her falling off the thing than <laughs> anything else. <laughs> I thought people were just, you know, Six milk bottles and a tuning fork was it, but that's that's way back in the past now. A little girl came up and said, "Oh, my dad's a big fan of yours," and I didn't know what it you know what it was from or anything. He came over, and then it turned out that he was asking me a lot about that sandwich scene. <laughs> he asked me if I still had the bread. Do I do you know? Do I go lay on it? I was just like, "What is happening?" <laughs> it was an awkward situation. That is that is pretty funny. Guess it didn't help. This was the most promoted image of the movie from the posters of the packaging, huh? I just thought it was uh, kind of silly at the time. Yeah. I probably don't want to think about it now. Thank you very much. <laughs> John was never strict about... Uh, uh, it was all okay with him if we came up with something. Not all those psycho garbage men who come around at 4.30 in the morning. They're not content to make the garbage and go. No, he has to take that big truck. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was uh, some stuff from my act um, that we were doing. A lot of the stuff that, that I was putting out in the film were bits that I had either worked on or had written before. And I was able to draw on all that, um, that, that kind of that file cabinet of, of humor and writing that I had stashed away. Because if, if you're a decent comedian, You've got files and files and files of stuff you've never even told anybody, you've never uttered on stage, and uh, nobody's ever read except you. But in the end, the good guys win and the bad guys lose. We got Charlie Jones from uh, NBC Sports, one of their top sportscasters for, for decades, literally. He got to do the winning locker room, and I had interviewed the bad guys, and uh, you know they were, they were not happy. Always tough to go into the losing locker rooms. Not quite Oscar worthy. We just had fun with it. I mean, how, how do you not have fun with a script like that? You get to know these folks and, and have a blast with them. Extremely easy to work with, really bright, and a great sense of humor. And John DeBello is a blast. He is just the sweetest guy and gives people enough rope to hang themselves all the time. Really good group of people behind and in front of the camera a lot of freedom in terms of the comedy. He would still let us play around and keep the energy fun in between and not go, come on, let's work, get back to set right now. You know, he would give you that extra little room to finish your bit and come over or say, oh, I've got an idea, let's try this. And he would take the time to try it. And I really appreciated that. Thus ending a chapter in the Killer Tomato series that kind of stands out in its own, like Nightmare on Elm Street 2 or Friday the 13th Part 5. When you write stand-up, the truest stuff is, is the real stuff that happens to you. 
But when I'm performing, I get very slapsticky, very charactery, very over the top ish. On our expedition, we found that the tomato was our friend. That was kind of the dichotomy of that movie, is trying to balance those two things. And that may be why the script came across that way. And that's another film that said too many people were sticking their fingers in it. And it, it kind of got off track. I wasn't happy with the script. I thought it was too much of horror in it. At least I don't think it worked. It was supposed to, following that for you, be a vehicle that made fun of, you know, popular culture and top shows and stuff. And yeah, I just don't think it worked very well. I, I think it's by far the poorest of the lot. Meanwhile, Foursquare was experiencing a different kind of success thanks to the merchandising deals that came with the Killer Tomatoes having a Saturday morning cartoon show. I remember when I first read, walked into a toy store and saw the toys, I was flabbergasted. There was uh, Chad, there was Tara, there was Fuzzy, and uh, Gangrene and the boys. It was a nice collection. Steve um, really handles a lot of that merchandising and ancillary market stuff. All that was handled by Fox. The toy line with Mattel was sort of the anchor of probably a hundred different licenses. Mattel's vision for a Killer Tomatoes toy line wasn't just an anchor, it was directly influencing the cartoon's upcoming second season behind the scenes, as well as the characters Foursquare had to include in their fourth tomato flick they had cooking. It was an era where the business of cartoons was being driven by the money in the toy market. You know, they went wide pretty quickly. You don't always do that. Sometimes you just go out with a few. It's like a platform theatrical release, even with merchandising. We had every merchandising deal that The Simpsons had, every one of them. They, because Fox forced everybody if, that was doing business with Simpsons to also do a killer tomato game. We just culturally had ideas. We tried to work closely with the people that uh, were writing the checks and had the vision. Uh, you know, you, you join a partner, you sort of let them do what they're good at. But you ultimately sit there and you go, okay, you guys know what you're doing. Here we go. From Applause's toys based on the first season of Attack of the Killer Tomatoes to Mattel series steering action figures for the cartoon's upcoming second season, merchandise for Foursquare's cult creation exploded. Pencil toppers, keychains, toys that zipped, squirted, and screamed, lunch boxes, Halloween costumes, art and storybooks, even dinnerware. Beach towels are nice. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can pick out which one is the silliest one. Our vote for the lamest piece of Killer Tomatoes merch has got to be the sewing pattern kit from Simplicity. Looks like a bunch of cool ready-to-wear costumes for youngins, but it's really some do-it-yourself arts and craft project need your mama to sew for you. Yeah, that's a good one. I would vote for that one. <laughs> that, that is pretty bad. <laughs> to this day, people are still sending me merchandise to autograph. It's still out there. The only one I really remember, other than the tomatoes, was the Wilbur Finletter action figure, because Steve Peace went on to be a California state senator. And how many California state senators, hell, how many politicians have their own action figure? I just thought that was the coolest part about it. He's got three kids, and hey, you know, my dad's an action figure. God, I, I wasn't an action figure. You know, I am an action figure, so that, that's the sort of the enduring bonus, I guess. Well, next to you, the only other actor closest to being immortalized in plastic was Steve Lundquist, who was more or less the model for Gang Green's henchman, Igor. Oh, goodness. That's funny. No way. That's uh, my big old mouth. That's awesome. I mean, they looked like they were like dog toys. I mean, like, you know, so you got a squishy thing that squeaks. I mean, is, how much are you going to do with that? I mean, it just never made sense to me. It always stupefied me why Mattel packaged these random yahoos to fight the killer tomatoes. Instead of these wage slaves of public service, why weren't they the rest of the tomato task force? I'd much rather have Sam, Floyd, and Mary than these randos. In terms of our participation, you know, conceptually with the show and the merchandising, we definitely had a say in it, but we didn't drive it. Given Fox's strategy for fast food tie-ins, why were killer tomatoes not an obvious add-on for youngins plummeting diets? We had a number of deals that were in the food business that we were very close to landing. The closest we came was a jack-in-the-box deal that, I mean, talk about bad timing. 
three days before the board meeting that this thing is brought with management, there was an outbreak in a jack-in-the-box in their meat in Washington. More than 150 people have become ill after eating tainted hamburger meat at jack-in-the-box restaurants in Idaho and Washington State. One child has died. Turns out, in the same meeting, they, they want to consider whether they're going to do a, a big ad campaign built around killer tomatoes. <laughs> Maybe that's not such a good idea. The biggest missed opportunity I gotta grill you for is not making killer tomato toys as big as basketballs. That's what fans like me really wanted. I mean, there were toy lines like Super Mad Balls running with this idea, so why didn't y'all? We obviously weren't that smart. We would, you know, we, we, we made the movie, the movie came out of that, but we didn't, and all the good ideas just went right by us. <laughs> Never occurred to me. <laughs> Well, it seems Mattel was on the verge of producing a line of six-inch tomato puppets, but canceled them before they ever hit stores. A few surviving prototypes were swiped by Mattel toy designers at the time and have become extremely sought-after collectibles that rarely pop up for sale online. Could there have been anything cooler? We had a Game Boy game. I mean, we had a game. That's right! Fans get to play as Finletter and fight Killer Tomatoes to stop Gang Green from being the first video game villain to rule the world! That, that was licensed through Fox and it was part of the whole cartoon release. Man, Steve, you got to be a movie star, an action figure, cartoon character, and video game hero? I don't really have any context of that character in the cartoons being me or what it's, it, it, it doesn't look any different to me than any other cartoon character. Total out of body experience. Just how involved were y'all with developing the games? I see somebody missed Costa's notes and spelled Gangreen's name wrong. Met with the game developers, and they basically asked us questions about characters, this, that, and the other kind of thing. But then they were off on their own. Yeah, they, they did not. Again, they didn't involve us. Did y'all enjoy playing it at least? No, I have one. <laughs> but I never own a Game Boy, so I've never played it. <laughs> We basically said, we're doing this, we're doing other things too. You know, let's roll with it and see what happens. And, you know, it just didn't work. Killer Tomatoes Strike Back was sort of done in parallel with the launch of the to try to take advantage of the synergy. That was a magic word. It was the idea that Hollywood was getting their arms around what is common practice now, that look, with all the multiple platforms and the ability to cross promote, can you leverage a property, make a tent pole out of it, and have parallel paths of success? So the idea was you do either do a small theatrical or you would do a straight to video release as a movie that would introduce some of the characters from the cartoon series and at the same time continue some of the characters from the movies. So it sort of became a hybrid effort. The next one, we had the luxury of knowing what the characters were, and so we had time to develop them. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you went to eat your heart. <laughs> there were business reasons why we were cranking out the fourth picture. Fox had an obligation to exercise sequel rights within a certain period of time. So we, we turned out three and immediately started moving on four. I'm writing, uh, helping write right now that Killer Tomatoes go to France. Okay, number four. Number four. Okay, number four. It's like that fungus on your bathroom wall. It just keeps coming back. You think Costa had to go to New York or something for his, for his park ranger job. So we ended up working independently and I submitted the script and I guess John uh, didn't care for a lot of it. So it was very much rewritten. Promising a sequel of cultural significance across the pond at the end of the return of the Killer Tomatoes, Foursquare got to work on their most ambitious veggie flick yet. Los Tomates Francos Munch Munch. Or that is, Killer Tomatoes Eat France. This is based on a true story. I was doing uh, some research on a documentary I was writing on the history of Grey Poupon and came across these recently declassified government documents. Changed a few of the dates and names for government sensibilities, but it is in fact a story that needed to be told. I'm glad we're finally able to put it on film. Like a stubborn evil weed, Professor Gain Green and his sidekick Igor are back with a new crew of Tomato Minions and once again plot the overthrow of mankind. 
Setting up shop in the land of fries and funny hats, France becomes ground zero for the latest tomato invasion after Gang Green discovers an old book prophesizing the return of its one true king who bears a striking resemblance to Igor. It's... It's me! Yes, it's you! <laughs> Reason to rig this elaborate prediction and trick the whole country into bowing before Igor is our long-awaited monarch. The only hope for squishing Gang Green's twisted fairy tale is an American tourist claiming to be Michael J. Fox and his gullible hag of a Frenchy girlfriend, Marie. But will they be enough to save France and restore the one true king to his throne? Boy, howdy, Steve! With you pulling double duty as Igor and the prophesized king, Foursquare was sure putting all their tomatoes in your basket, weren't they? I'd rather not have the spotlight. <laughs> I'm not carrying the movie, but I'm, I'm like the guy. I'm like, oh my gosh, no. But they said, no, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. I was like, well, okay, you know. And with Aston and Lundquist back in the saddle as Gang Green and Igor, the hunt was on for casting the latest heroes in the Killer Tomato series, beginning with Mark Price. You know, Mallory, there are two Skippies. <laughs> A good Skippy and a bad Skippy. Would you like to go out with either of us on Friday night? Mark is he's just a, a really wonderful guy. He's, he's got a thousand ideas a minute. He's tremendously energetic. <laughs> well, remember that uh, George Clooney had done uh, the one before it. And I guess his agents had bigger things in mind for him. That's why he didn't do this one. I guess my age is not the same way, and who knows, maybe they were right. I was a fan from the beginning. I was a youngster when I saw it on TV on the Z channel, which was an early cable channel in LA. And the song and the helicopter and the whole thing, I was a complete nerd fan of it from the very beginning. As for Michael's beast of a love interest who makes googly eyes at in France, the role of Marie required an actress of universal beauty. Angela Visa. 22-year-old Angela is a green-eyed blonde. She's five feet nine inches tall. So I was cast before because I remember I read with all the girls, which was uh, kind of fun. But Angela was the standout, and there was really no question about it. Her beauty and uh, her sense of humor, the, how funny she was. What, what a natural talent. I don't know how we got Angela. I'm really not sure how we came about to get her. I think as John told me that we got Miss Universe to be in this film, and I was like, you're kidding. <laughs> you, you don't mean the like, one from 1946, right? You mean somebody now? <laughs> I can see getting the one from 1946. We can afford that. <laughs> I just happened to see her in a Rose Bowl parade like a year before. So that looks like a, you know, pleasant, nice person. And a year later, I'm working with her. Who? It's just total coincidence. I remember it was the very first thing I ever did because I came off of my years as Universe and before that I lived my whole life in a little village in Holland. But after my years as Universe I decided to stay in Los Angeles, see where that would lead me. And here we have a, a Dutch lady playing a French lady so they're, they're close but not exactly the same. It was a thrill for me to have this be my first experience. Of course, I took it very serious and I did the best that I could. I wasn't familiar with, with any of it. It was all new to me. <laughs> I was thrilled to audition. It was a brand new, wonderful experience for me. The fact that some of it was going to be shot in France, which I love France. At the end of the previous film, you know, I, I had inserted the Killer Tomatoes will return and Killer Tomatoes go to France because you know, we did that at James Bond movies. And I did that because I wanted to go to France. <laughs> so I put it in the end credits. And then when we were going to do another film, we go, okay, I guess we got to write one. So we ended up filming there. And as we say in the credits, the entire movie was shot there except the parts that weren't. He really thinks we're in Paris. We did all the interiors in the States. They had a line where they discussed this mall, which was built by these clever French de designers to look exactly like a mall in San Diego, California. But a genuine replica of San Diego's magnificent Horton Plaza. 151 specialty stores and restaurants for your shopping convenience. You know, that's the magic of movie making. Any place can be, I'm in France right now. Here, this is my, welcome to my French kitchen. A lot of it was in a studio and a set, you know. So it wasn't even a sound stage. They had found an empty industrial building that had not been built out with offices or anything. And 
Uh, they built all the sets in there, but there were also some outlying offices where we could set up our little, you know, our little tomato puppet world. Steve, I remember just when he would come and visit us in the our little puppet room and goofing off, make jokes, and he was just a lot of fun to be around, a lot of fun to work with. <laughs> Shut up! By the time we got to Killer Tomatoes Eat France, and I blame myself because I wrote a lot of it, every scene had a puppet or an explosion or a special effect or an audio animatronic, something it was like, who wrote this? And it's like, oh crap, I did. I think I was thrown so quickly into Strikes Back um, and we just had to make stuff so fast and then shoot it so fast that it was all kind of a blur. But then we kind of took a break and, and, and really had some time to work on the puppets for Eats France, and I was on set every day for that, operating one of them. I, I had a you know a small shop then. That was actually my first shop. They they designed them. They gave me the designs, and we just had to sculpt them. We just had to make them three dimensional. But I think that was because, and I don't know for sure, but I think that was because there already were plans to do the cartoon and plans to do the toys. We knew about those characters. We incorporated those characters on purpose. That's right. That's what Fox wanted. They wanted Ross merchandising because they did make toys and action figures and beach blankets and lunch boxes and all kinds of junk. They wanted to be sure that uh, those things showed up in the film. Zoltan I'm partial to because I got to operate that one and voice that one as well. He was always kind of my favorite. He was also always my favorite design. Puppets are tough when, when they have those really big mouths with the big teeth. It's a very difficult thing to puppeteer. And these were basically just a basketball with a big mouth, and so they were hard to operate. They were the most sophisticated in terms of puppetry. <laughs> the most advanced tomato puppets. I would think they're the only tomato puppets. <laughs> Let alone the most advanced. I can't imagine anybody making more puppets of tomatoes. I'm just saying. Yeah, I think the bigger ones were more cable controlled, actually. They were a big empty shell with the skin on it. So there was actually quite a bit of room. I mean, a good basketball size. But yeah, they had cables coming out of them to move the eyes. And, and those puppets were very uncomfortable as well, because there were fiberglass inside with acrylic uh, palettes and, and teeth and just, just uncomfortable to operate. We're always built into a set somehow. Uh, operating these hand puppets or things like the, you know, the, the, the big hot air balloon with John Aston and, you know, we're all down at butt height operating these things and always uncomfortable, always in some uncomfortable, you know, in a, again, in a car trunk, in, just in something odd. The logistics of making a movie, it's, it's fun before and it's fun after. It's not always a lot of fun when you're trying to do it because you're fighting the clock and you're dealing with the realities of production. A lot of times there were three of them because they were a trio. So not only did you have to make the puppet work, you had to make them quote unquote act together. And that took time. I think he always wanted them to do more and he wanted me to always, you know, to, to try to give him ideas of, of what these can do and can't do. But it's like at the end of the day, it's a, it's a, it's a basketball with a mouth that you gotta hide up in the body. They're very limited. <laughs> well, you could have fooled me. How'd you get them suckers to bounce together without a computer trick up your sleeve? They were kind of just marionettes, basically. They, they had marionette wires coming out of them and a very basic marionette, you know, handle so that you could have a little bit of control and turn them. Again, I'm going to say it was just all very low tech. But that was the, the movie. I think that was what we all kind of embraced. The Killer Tomatoes is not, you know, it's supposed to be kind of B movie. And you're supposed to see the strings bouncing the tomato. You could get away with that stuff. The practical locations are always the most difficult. Those, so those are never a lot of fun because, you know, you're cramming yourself into some space that isn't meant for a human being. Yeah, that would have been uh, the most challenging. But that, again, that's that's the job of a puppeteer. It's just, it's what you do. It's, it's not a comfortable, glamorous profession. It was fun. It, it added a, a, a unique dimension. It made uh, Killer Tomatoes Eat France uh, sort of one of a kind, which is, yeah, what you're trying to do. FP will return after a short intermission. They loved me, and they had to have me back. It was a one-day shoot for a couple of hours. I was in and out, and I thought it was just silliness. I had to ask, like, okay, so what happened here? Oh, well, this is the, the rock band, the bad rock band, because I didn't, I didn't understand FT. It's just two initials. Okay, so that's good, and so it would be stuff like that. And these are bad. I'm scared of that. And so it became literally, I think I probably yelled, just give me adjectives. <laughs> 
You're scared. Uh, 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 paranoia. Uh, uh, fear. You can't believe it. Duck it. So stuff like that. Ain't gonna lie, I'm actually digging the sweet tomato rap y'all came up with. But just who are Shockadelic and the Fat Man? I, I can't find any other ditties by them anywhere. Yeah, that's, I think it's made up. I think the Fat Man could have been Rick. <laughs> he was about 300 pounds, so that's my guess. You kidnapped FT. You're behind all this. Quite right. The man is, uh, you know, he is who he is, a legend. And so, uh, and he, even he said that I look like his son. So a lot of people tell me I look like Sean Astin, but having John Astin, you know, that say it, that cemented it as accurate. Obviously, the man knows his own son. I came from Holland. I was not familiar with any of them. Uh, maybe that was better. What I did learn from the year prior is Miss Universe, where they sent you to the White House and where the, you, you know, I worked with humongous stars that I did realize during that year that they're all people, right? They all get nervous or they all have bad days. So I kind of went into that with that attitude where I knew how accomplished all of them were, but I wasn't intimidated in a way of like, oh my gosh, I just approached them as people and they turned out to be the nicest people. I enjoyed all aspects of the movie. I enjoyed going to Paris on location. We actually talked to 20th about shooting a lot of the stuff in France on green screen because that was just beginning. But we were getting blank looks. He's crazy! It is out of his mind! Because it wasn't being used yet. And, you know, now it's pro forma. But then it was it was still new. We brought a few of the actors over, you know, Mark Price, Angela in particular. And then we doubled other people or we shot parts of the scenes here. The principals didn't go to France. John Aston didn't go to France. and. Steve Longquist didn't go to France. Uh, no, wait, Steve did, but John Aston didn't. Given budget constraints and John's schedule, maybe a combination of both. I think it was just cost. I never had a conversation with them about that. I think they decided before they even asked, asked me to do it. I would have gone, but I think they wanted to know that they had enough time to get what they wanted, because they, they had a lot of shots uh, in a car or, you know, shooting the people in the streets. I completely understand that. I mean, it can get so expensive. Fun that show biz. We were flown over, it was a skeleton crew. It wasn't a lot of people that came by because we had the French crew there. Um, but I think it was, you know, most of the cast, right? No, I did not get to go to France. <laughs> That's true. I did not go to France. No, it was not, yeah. They went without me. I didn't get to go to France. Well, that's no surprise. This is the first Killer Tomatoes flick to not even mention everyone's favorite Tomato War veteran, Wilbur Finletter. What's up with that? The, the character just wasn't anything we focused on. It wasn't, we didn't leave him out on purpose. It just wasn't part of the story that we developed. Again, I was in the legislature. I was elected to the State Assembly in 1982 and then to the Senate in 92. And I'm the chair of the budget committee and doing other stuff. There's no way I would have had time. The best evidence of my failed movie career is uh, I had to descend into the abyss of politics. So double checking the scorecard here, that means the only folks to appear in every one of the Killage Mana movies are Costa Dillon and DJ Sullivan. I am Mrs. Williams and I did that role in the first three films. You think he's dead? Well, I, I Will you miss him? Well, you Will you marry again? <laughs> what if he's laying in a ditch somewhere like, with both his legs <laughs> calling your name? Sometimes you do a movie and you see a scene in your mind and then it comes out that way. It's DJ's scene. <clears throat> DJ was a fabulous actress. <laughs> she also was uh, the sort of the matron of the act of local San Diego actors. She had a, ran an acting class here in San Diego in addition to having a, a very successful career in Hollywood. A man came up behind me and sat a tomato in the middle of my hamburger and french fries. And he says, would you sign it? Okay, and he handed me the pen and I signed Mrs. Williams' attack of the killer tomato on this tomato that was about this big. 
Not only did she play a bit part in all four Killage Mana movies, she even had a role in Foursquare's sophomore flick, Happy Hour, or as some know it, Sour Grapes. Are you gonna pay for this, Fred? Well, are you gonna fix it? Your car's in my garage! And DJ wasn't the only Happy Hour actor jumping ship to Killage Mana sequels. Remember Debbie Fairs, the poster girl of bikini perfection, playing the bad guy's bumbling secretary? She also holds a record for being in the most Killer Tomato sequels. She was George Clooney's Dream Tomato in Returns, the spoof of a slasher victim in Strikes Back, and if you pay attention in Killer Tomatoes Eat France, she plays a showgirl who opens the door when Gang Green comes knocking to sabotage FT's peace concert. Sacre bleu! It is Santa Claus! Ah uh, ha ha! Ho ho ho! Right! While we're having a sidebar, did y'all know the Tomato's hot air balloon is famous itself? No one from Foursquare remembers all the details, but this eyesore they rented belongs to none other than the Flying Tomato Brothers, Ralph and Joe, who used this sucker as a promotional tool for their chain of Garcia's Pizza in a Pan restaurants. Famous for their innovative approach selling pizza by the slice and rectangular pans since the 70s, the Flying Tomato Brothers are still serving up their signature dish today, and some locations even have flying tomato props waiting for y'all to snap a picture with your favorite killer tomato. Tell them Dead West sent you. Let's go to France. <laughs> Michael, look at that big black thing. We must be getting near Paris. Yeah. When we flew to France, I sat next to her, and, and you know she fell asleep on my shoulder, and the whole time I'm sitting there going, Miss Universe is sleeping on my shoulder, and I can't move. <laughs> <laughs> so it was my first time uh, to France. It was uh, my only time to France, and I was so young at the time too, probably 20, 21, something like that. I'm 22 years old, I'm backpacking through France. Life is wonderful. And so uh, it was a split crew, it was a huge effort. It was the first feature film I shot in France. In the 80s, I, I did the official documentary on the making of the 1984 Olympics. You were at the 84 Olympics? Is that where you met Steve for the first time? I did not meet him during the Olympics. I knew of him. Um, he was huge in the 84 games. And, uh, but I had not met him yet. So that was just kismet, just coincidence. No, Chuck, not this time. I fly me to France, coach. They put me up at a one-star hotel. It doesn't even have a drink. I think the stress level in the France one was a little higher on everybody. Because, you know, you're dealing with foreign crews and you're dealing with a lot of stuff that you don't have to in the States. And I think the stress level on the director and everybody else is a little different in time. You know, you couldn't dilly dally around. You know, if they say we're going to be five days in France, we're going to be five days in France. We're not going to be six. We're not going to be six and a half. And so the budget's ticking, however small it was, and I can guarantee you, they were cognizant of that budget. That that was a demanding schedule. That that picture was shot on a very demanding schedule and included travel. It was difficult um, shooting in France. We could do a whole hour just on the cultural differences. A dramatic change it was for those of us. We, we had shot in LA or San Diego for a while. And then we went to Paris and we had a French crew. And now everybody drank at lunch. And it changed the afternoon so dramatically. Finally, the director was like, just, but we had like the latest lunches. Lunch was like at the total end of the day at some point. But you know, that's just, just part of life. And, and every, every country's a little bit different. I've shot a lot in Holland. I've shot a lot in Italy and Germany. Every culture is a little bit different and some are more um, aligned with American style and others are different. France, at least at the time, quite a bit different. I've done a lot of smaller projects in France since then, but um, nothing as big as that. And then logistically, that was quite an effort. So I remember we came up against another crew from a bigger movie and we were like borrowing stuff from their truck because they had like all this extra equipment and our crew was like, sal you know, the lighting guy was like, you know, salivating. Why do Americans always wait until the middle of the movie to fall madly in love? Why not at first sight? Stupid Americans. I have such fond memories of him as well. He was kind and so funny, cute and wonderful, um, we had the best time. He was a TV actor, so he's used to playing the stage, playing the space. In a movie, you gotta be a little more disciplined in terms of where you're going and what you're doing. So we had to, we had to focus a little more on process. John DiBello was always so funny, and we jammed on a lot of stuff. And he was fun to work with, and 
definitely had the spirit of the movie and actually very creative. He came up with some fun ideas on set. I always love it when, when an actor brings an extra dimension to a project. Um, I, I always hope anything I do is 10% better because of the contributions of everyone. I remember I came in one day with like all these like uh, punch up jokes, you know, and they were like, ah, okay, we'll use like four. Yeah. <laughs> Who are you? Me? I'm a big American movie star. I love American movies. Which one are you? Michael J. Fox. Hi. He asked uh, Michael J. Fox if he had any problem with it. He told us he did not, so he wasn't going to complain or try to sue us or something. Yeah, I think I got the unofficial official permission from the source. So shoot straight with me. You ever get to meet the real Michael J. Fox since then? Surely Mark gave you the hookup as his TV buddy and all. No, I have not. That would have been wonderful, but I have not yet. <laughs> Look, I have to level with you. I'm not Michael J. Fox. I don't think that one ever worked, but back in those days, I could use the Skippy card. You know, that's what we called it. I had a car that uh, broke down and I was with some friends. We were on the side of the road and people weren't stopping to pick us up. And so I put on the Skippy glasses and I did a big goofy smile and sure enough, somebody pulled over. Who am I kidding? I am a beast. Why can't I look like a real French woman? Oh, Frenchy. I mean, uh, uh, ugly character for me is a big word. I had to do some things I would never do in real life, like slapping Mark Price. Have you seen Chinatown? It's my favorite. Chinatown? My sister, my daughter, my... <laughs> and you know, the professional way to do it is you don't actually, you know, ever smack the other actor. There's a way to kind of do it the appropriate way. <laughs> but I was like, no, no, go ahead, hit me, hit me. <laughs> I just kind of made her I made her do it. This scene like will stay with me for the rest of my life. I actually, it wasn't fake. I actually had to slap him many, many times over. I had a really hard time doing that. I'm such a non-violent, peaceful person. He was so accommodating and so nice about it. So he made it easier for me. We? Oui? Yeah, I guess you've seen it. Uh, and Angie's great. Um... She was so much fun to work with and just a, a total pro and just an absolute sweetheart. And you can see why she was Miss Universe and then later voted the most beautiful Miss Universe of all time in a Miss Universe poll because it's not just the way she looks. She had a wonderful personality and just a first class person. And just everybody really enjoyed working with her. Where's this castle you've been babbling about? Call that a castle, you Aryan ignoramus? No, sir, Professor Gangrene, that's a tool shed. That's the castle. I think it was the five week shooting schedule, probably three weeks in the States, two weeks, mostly exterior locations and the really big castle. Wow, how cool it was to go to an actual castle, get to hang out. You know how much time any movie, even our little movie, they take a lot of time and pride in the lighting and setting it up just right and there's always so much time for the actors to just hang out go explore and it, it, when it's at a place like a castle on a mountain you know, it's so much fun i went in that castle and it was nasty there were more flying rats in that place than you can stake a stick at uh, pigeons um uh, i call them flying rats uh pigeon they were nasty i mean they there was rat poop all over a nest and they were loud and they're flapping and all oh, it was creepy too. No, not for me. Thank you. 36 B cup, why? <laughs> so I definitely had a love relationship with Fuzzy Tomato. It was just super cute. I wanted to take him home <laughs> and, and have him as decoration in my house or something like that. It just gave me so much experience in so many different areas, you know, especially when do you get to work with a puppet like that? It was absolutely gorgeous. I thought she did very well, too, for someone without a lot of experience. But, but she was very nice and was lots of fun to work with. It was a scene where uh, she's supposed to kick him in the shins to escape his clutches in the, in the castle because he's the bad guy. 
So you're about to shoot it and, and the, the direction of Angela, kick him as hard as you can in the shins and run away. He'll grab his shin in pain. And she's, well, I don't want to hurt him. You're not going to hurt him. He's padded up. Just go ahead and, and kick him as hard as you can. You know, we'll just shoot the rehearsal. It's a quick scene. We're a little behind schedule. We'll just do it. It's a really easy scene. Just kick him as hard as you can in the shins. And she goes, I, I really don't want to do that. I, I, I don't want to hurt him. And I called the assistant camera over and said, look, kick, kick John in the shins as hard as you can. And he goes, bam, and kicks him in the shin. And John looks at Angela and says, see? And Angela says, oh, those are his shins. Had we shot that scene, that might have been the end of John Aston's career. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, my goodness. So I see you guys have some skin in the game this time around with the product placement gags, huh? We're shameless. We're shameless as blatant product placement. But again, in the spirit of Killer Tomatoes, yeah, absolutely. I had a whole set. I, I, I think I still have them somewhere. Well, as a Killer Tomatoes puppeteer, you have the ultimate tomato collection with your movie versions of Zoltan, Ketchup, and Fang Mado. Just recently, I finally just had to throw away Zoltan and Ketchuk and because um, they had just finally rotted away after 30 years, the skins would, had literally just rotted away. And I just thought, why, why am I continuing to carry these around? So all that stuff got thrown away. No! My favorite part of that scene was actually where uh, we had the official US high school issue map on the wall with all the countries scrambled in the wrong places. That's why our students are so crappy in geography. It's not that they don't care. It's the maps that are provided just aren't very good. The jokes never stop. It's like we would be late at night and there was always still new jokes and always laughing from the moment you arrived till, you know, regardless of how late we shot or how long of a day it was, there were always jokes and it was just so light and fun. I was into it. I, I was really into the jokes. I was into the physical comedy in it. So I just had a very small part. I, it wasn't my big line, the bastards or something like that. Mustard gas! The devils! <laughs> that was funny. That was a fun scene. Igor! No, I am Louis, but my friends call me Franchi. And you, good sir, are a true friend. I wish I had somebody coaching me through it. Listen, I've got a terrible... Uh, English accent. I mean, you, you know, I speak English in Southern two languages. Throw in a French accent, France accent. I'm horrible. So imagine a guy who, who who's terrible with lines, trying to speak France, and uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the French accent it kind of made it, I think, almost funnier. I would think because it was so bad. Steve's great. He's so much fun and just always positive. Just uh, a wonderful guy. Somehow he got into. Uh, he got into a bit of a scuffle on the streets of France with some nut, some guy, when he was in his full Louis the Seventeenth costume. Not on screen, just there was some Looney Tune near the sets. And I remember some guy coming out, which is almost perfect, because we made a joke about rude, rude, rude street. This guy came up and spat in my face when I was sitting in the car. Thought I was Howard Stern. The, the, the whole the whole idea was to not make fun of the French, of course, but to make fun of the way Americans stereotype the French. If any French people were offended, I think they you would hope they would laugh along with the fact that we were making fun of Americans stereotyping the French, not the French directly. I got a, a fan letter from someone in uh, southern Belgium that said, this that's my favorite movie, and I don't know, maybe... Uh, is because they're Belgian, they weren't that in, insulted by France, but they certainly know the culture. And uh, they they had fun with the characterization of the uh, French, but they also had fun with the characterization of the American tourists. Because all the American tourists are large people, and that is the European stereotype of Americans. So we wanted to be equal opportunity stereotypists, and so we were. Yeah, and Steve swam in the scenes. And again, lots of credit for that. It's not the cleanest river. And he did it. <laughs> well, you know, he's a gold medal Olympic swimmer. Guy okay? knows how to swim. That's like a different kind of cool, you know, to meet your athletic hero. You know, it's just different. And then he proved to be a stellar guy and a real bro. 
yeah, just nothing but fun. And I miss him. Just a great, one of those great, a great energy, you know, just somebody that puts off good, positive energy to other people. How can we afford all this on my mental disability check? Yes, we definitely had a bigger budget, for sure. Wide variety of different style of puppets. They were very, very good at what they did. What is it? Well, it appears to be a giant, slobbering, somewhat overweight tomato with a cape and mask. It's, it's Fan Tomato of the Opera! Ah! And then I was also inside the, 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 the Phantom one, because that, that one was huge. The whole thing was on a gurney-type cart that we would push or that took most of the weight that I would sit on inside and then we had the, the big foam you know costume legs basically that would walk and, and then I you know I had a big lever that would <laughs> open up the mouth and a tongue that I wore on, on my arm that we made and eyes that would go back and forth and it was all just very simple inside it was very simple mechanics you know it's kind of like the wizard in, in, in the Wizard of Oz pulling these big levers and they're nothing very high tech in there at all but then he also had to breathe fire. And that thing was scary because, you know, we had Mike Lambert, who was the, the special effects guy who had rigged it to blow fire. And I'm inside this polyfoam skinned tomato, just thinking if, if this thing catches fire, um, um, there's no quick way out of here. I think I had a flame retardant that we just kind of painted on the lips and, and hoped for the best. You know, I was like 25 years old at the time. So young and stupid and, and just eager to, to be involved with something and to create. Uh, two Polish dogs and some fries. Fries? Foreign or domestic? Domestic, of course. Goss is funny as heck. He, all those guys, they're just, they're fun. And they and they would they would say, oh, this would be a great joke here. This would be a great joke there. And, that, and, and these guys got along so well, they went, yeah. And they'd just laugh among themselves. The four squares would laugh among themselves. They just fought. They were such great friends, and that really translated for me on the set. They were so kind and so patient and so funny. I mean, they were like these two peas in a pod and always joking around. That is, of course, a big square and round thing, built by someone to remember something sometime. And I still remember I had my good old Smith Corona typewriter, because it was 1990, typing out and then there is a Ben-Hur style car chase around the Arc de Triomphe period. And sitting back and going, okay, now I just put that on paper. How in the hell are we gonna do that? Now I'll be darned six months later, I'm in a camera car approaching the Arc de Triomphe. So if you write it in a Smith Corona typewriter, it comes true. I think we're one of the first films, uh, or a few films that got to shoot around the Arc de Triomphe. You know, we shot going in circles around that thing for hours. How often can anybody say, I'm in France uh, driving around in a Citroën and doing a chase scene around the, the Arc de Triomphe for a Killer Tomatoes movie? Think about that. How they pulled that off is beyond me. The car chase around the Arc de Triomphe was actually a mix between shooting around the Arc de Triomphe and also just some close-ups in Southern California. Who'd have thought that somebody would be hanging out the window trying to kidnap another car, going around the Art and the Triumph, and they held the traffic up for us. That doesn't happen. I mean, that's something you see Tom Cruise do, not Steve Lundquist. I don't think we shut anything down. I think we just jumped in the middle of it. I think that was what was so fun about it, right? Is uh, a lot of the location shots and stuff that we did, we either had permission or we didn't. These guys went to France, had no permits, right? And this is a studio picture, mind you. and and shot those scenes on the Shandis, I can't pronounce that, the, the big circle, right? And no permits, no nothing, just went and said, here we go, let's go, get in and out of here as fast as you can. I, I, I will forever regret not having had the opportunity to be part of that little mini French revolution. Hey, if it works, it works, and color me impressed. But I bet it was a real challenge finding someone to double a looker like Angela for those scenes. Uh, we got a stunt double for her for the work around the Arc de Triomphe in the car. And it turned out that we found a, uh, a woman who looked remarkably like Angela. It's not easy to find somebody that looks like Miss Universe. Turns out, not only did she come from the same town in Holland, she grew up three blocks away by total coincidence. So wherever that town in Holland is, guys, you might wanna, you might wanna spend some time there, just a tip. 
I gotta tell you, Steve, I know you had your doubts, but you really pulled this sucker off. I mean, you do everything in this flick. Jailbreaks, car chases, war scenes, cultural takeovers, playing twins, being an entrepreneur, terrorist, being a good guy, a henchman. Is this why you haven't done any acting since Tomato Z France? Was there just nothing left to prove after all that? Yeah, that's it. I'd done everything I could in acting. <laughs> oh my god. And after one or two weeks of foreign misdemeanors, Philman wrapped on the tomato's biggest adventure yet with everyone headed back stateside. That was what was so cool. When the movie finished, I actually stayed and hung out for like an extra month or so. Kind of did what the character did in the movie. In fact, I used the same backpack and stuff. I remember going on the food tour, Dijon, Manet, Merlot. I went to like anything I recognized as a food. Oui, I will show you the sights. He uh, was really looking forward and excited to see Amsterdam. My brother and I and my cousin and her husband took him to Amsterdam and showed him around. He was like a kid in a candy store is how you say it, right? Uh, she showed off some of, the, some of the spots for sure. Meanwhile, back in the old US of A, post-production was underway. We recorded everything live, but then we went in later and redid all the voice work. Bombs away! <laughs> I didn't even know if, that I was going to end up doing the voice for Zoltan when we were puppeteering. I think just because of the scratch track I did, John seemed to like it. And so then um, they had me do the come, come back later and actually record all the, the lines for him. I, I, I think for me, it was just, you know, that, that gruff. He, I mean, he's just such an ugly character with those big, ugly teeth. And, and he, he's just such a gruff character. It's just what he sounded like to me. I don't know. And this is the first I'm actually hearing about a fourth movie. That's that's fascinating to me. I don't feel like I own any role except for one. I, I would not ever want to hear another actor playing Brain from Pinky and the Brain. Other than that, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a worker for hire. I'm a voice for hire. I'm glad to be there when the job's going on. And if they need to move on to another actor, thank you for the work. That's, that's my attitude. It's the only attitude to really have. This really was one where everybody got along and it was really a cool little thing. And generally that starts at the top, you know, they say that's how it works. And John was at the top and he was such a great guy. So he was, you know, he was mellow. I don't remember him ever freaking out. I maybe got mad at me a couple of times. That's every director gets mad at me a couple of times, but uh, he didn't, he didn't, uh, you know, blow up or do anything uneven. You know, he's the, he's such a great guy. I mean, he's got his life together. He's a good role model. The atmosphere and the set and everybody that we were working with, again, I sound like a broken record, but it was just all fun and laughs. I had fun with it. Now, I gotta ask, that's you on the poster, right? Everything's so exaggerated, I can never be sure. Yes, they had to get that up. I don't recall how many times I had to wash it after to get all the hairspray and whatever they used. I thought it was perfect for the movie and perfect for what they were trying to achieve. So I, I do remember that day completely going with it and say, okay, if that's, if that's what I need to do, then go put my hair up, <laughs> you know? We had a, probably the only people that ever had a provision and a contract with a distributor in which we had the ability to prohibit the distributor to taking a picture out theatrically. And interestingly enough, Fox Home Video, who had the contract on the movie, decided they wanted to take the picture out. I'd say it is, without a doubt, the most important vegetable movie of our time. We blocked it. Say what? We understood the cross-collateralization consequences from, you know, prior movies. And this was in the heyday of video, right? People were making made-for-video movies, and we were doing really well in video. And we had a title that was already recognized and we picked up. And so we knew we would make a modest profit and there were not a lot of costs to be deducted against a pure video release. Whereas if you go out theatrically, you build up a bunch of costs in P&A and, and you got to recover all that. And it's, you know, it, it's been great since then. So I have zero regrets. I'm glad to be a part of it. Riding high with a top-rated cartoon series, licensed collectibles, and two new flicks hitting video stores, Foursquare was living every indie filmmaker's dream. What could stop them? <laughs> I had less to do with season two. I sort of helped sort of, you know, kick it off and then was doing other things. 
I think they wanted to sort of extend and open up the creative possibilities, probably feeling they'd played out the town. Also, you know, if you look to Killer Tomatoes, the whole idea in the first movie was sort of this tongue-in-cheek, War of the Worlds kind of approach. So I think they may have gone a little broader trying to extend some some storylines. That's, that's my take on it. They wanted to go in a slightly more dangerous, dramatic direction that the tomatoes were. They weren't anything to really be amused at anymore. And Gangrene was really trying to, you know, implement these diabolical plots. Yeah! 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 Swap and Childish laughs for more serious grit. But is that your older brother's Killer Tomatoes cartoon? Revamping the show to match Mattel's toy line full of gimmicky tomato threats, Dr. Gangrene is fed up with his losing streak and goes all out, mutating his produce-sized partners in crime into larger-than-life threats to divide and conquer nations around the world with armies of tomato troops and, much to everyone's surprise, they succeed! Defeated and forced underground, our redress heroes in the first season become globe-trotting rebels and fight for mankind's return to the top of the food chain for the remainder of the season. With fewer gags, serialized storytelling, and the revolutionary use of computer animation over traditional hand drawings last season, this was a polarizing period for both the fans and creators. We had a say in the sense that we could have said no to stuff. We did discuss the change. There was no like big tension or debates or complaining back and forth. I mean, we all got along in that period. And we got along principally because we accepted the fact that this was their business. They knew it better than we knew it. And we would look kind of foolish suggesting otherwise. That's when I started sending them script ideas and getting rejected. Again, I was doing satires. I, I, I can still remember the title of one of them I wrote was Shrink the Bismarck. That gangrene figured out a way to reduce the world's navies to the size of toy boats and then drop tomatoes on them and try to sink them. Because I like the title. <laughs> and it just, uh, they just didn't want to deal with satire, it just wasn't their thing. None of us had any experience whatsoever in TV at all, let alone Saturday morning cartoons. And Margaret had a pretty serious resume of success. Well, especially with Richard Mueller still at the helm in the script department, right? Well, in the second season, I wrote only one. What? It was my uh, participation prize for having made no static about leaving the show. What happened? Joe Tarotero decided that they wanted to make changes. Joe came to me and said, look, we're going to bring Flint Dilly over to do the editing. You've done a great job, but they need someone to blame. This is not the first time I heard this about various, you know, situations. I said, it's okay with me. I don't have so much ego wrapped up in the show as I do just having fun and letting it be itself. So he said, thank you very much. It was probably the reason where he kept me on when the studio was closing. I was the third to the last person to go. In the first year, the animation was being done overseas in Korea. Joe Tarotero wanted to move the series to computer generated. There were a couple of big Cray computers down in San Diego that he had entree to. The transition from hand-drawn animation to digital, the show was one of the first, if not the first, digitally animated series. Well, some might argue that honor belongs to a series of three-minute shorts from 1989 called Geometric Fables, but y'all can still more or less claim Killer Tomatoes significantly advanced the art of geek box animation for the Incredible Crash Dummies and Reboot even set the standard for digital adventures a few short years later. I mean, y'all were making some serious history in digital doodling. If you look at your competition at the time, they were still using CGI as a flash in a pan gimmick to add a little pizzazz to their predominantly 2D production values. I do remember them announcing that, that we were going to start doing this computer animation. I was like, gosh, I wonder what that's going to look like. And so it did look good, thank God. So I was very, uh, very interested by that. I, I love to follow technology. I don't understand a lot of it, but when there's a leap, I, I like to, you know, read up on it. And we found out how many things you can't do right in animation with computer, like contact with a human. It's really hard to do a fight scene. You can't get the characters to touch. You have to move. It was a pain. They also did colorization of movies. One of the people that just coincidentally worked for the company, the guy I had known literally growing up with down the street. And I said, what are you working on? I said, I'm colorizing Citizen Kane. My neighbor and Orson Welles together made Citizen Kane. 
Given American Film Technologies only produced a single cartoon episode to sell a forgettable toy line, it was pretty risky of y'all banking on them to produce an entire season, but hey, it paid off. There was nothing else like this on Saturday morning at the time. And it was cooler then than it is now. Now it doesn't seem like any big deal, right? But it was a big deal. The Gang of Five is now the Gang of Six, and thanks to their mutated makeovers, Zoltan isn't the only tomato with a distinct personality anymore. Instead of nameless minions who can barely tell apart, each now has their own memorable theme. There's the bullheaded beefsteak, the saucy tomacho, the Egyptian-themed mamato, the gluttonous ketchup, and the snake in the grass fang who's renamed Fang Mato in the toy line, and Viper in the Killer Tomatoes Eat France for some weird reason. With all these monstrous changes, they needed a bunch more voices. Even Cam Clark was pulling double time, returning as Igor while playing Tamacho. I don't know how we chose the voices so random, but I did kind of a yo Vinny thing for him. Surrender this here nation to the killer tomatoes and their fierce leader, Gang Green. Sadite? Sadite. As if one Ninja Turtle actor ain't enough to have in the show's new lineup of voice box talents, the Marlon Brando sounding Mamato is played by his Green Machine co-star, better known at the time as the voice of Raphael. I auditioned, just like I have for pretty much, well, for, for virtually every show. Yeah, they came up with Mamato. I don't know why he speaks like he's sort of the godfather, but he's a tomato, tomato, let's call the whole thing off, I don't know. Disconcerting. I've made several of uh, wonderful uh, friendships from that show, not the least of which is Rob Paulson. I did one episode of the, uh, the New Adventures of Johnny Quest, and Rob was playing Haji. And then we ended up on Blue Tomatoes. That's where he and I really discovered uh, that we were very in sync comedically. But Rob Paulson did Pinky, and they were both you know, from Killer Tomatoes, those guys. I was pretty much transfixed by Moe's Orson Welles impression. We talk about it in, in other interviews where the focus isn't Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. And we throw it off like, yeah, we met on Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. It's like, what, huh? Wait, wait, you met where? You know, I, thought, I think we're talking about an Italian restaurant. Cam was definitely doing Ninja Turtles with Raw. And because they would talk about, you know, having to get to their Ninja Turtles session. They had a lot going on. There was no hierarchy with that. Nobody is ever pissed off that another actor has to go to a job. Hey, you guys, can you let Maurice finish up so he can go to his next gig? We all know how hard it is to get those jobs. So much of the humor from the first season was dropped for season two, and nowhere was it more evident than Zoltan's lack of funny voices. Well, that had to have been disappointing. I didn't take it personally, because the fun still started as soon as the tape stopped rolling. My thing is I just love to, you know, spritz and have fun with my funny friends. At least you got to flex your pipes with the return of the missing tomato link and an all-new character, the Fan Tomato of the Opera. What have you done? Now you see me as I really am. What inspired this voice? That's a British accent run through my nose. Oh yes, I'm just I'm keeping down. Hello. I'm bringing back all these voices to me that I can use now. I only used him once. He's he's basically still in the shrink wrap. That guy. Other new tomatoes were introduced as well. After the tomatoes turn on Gang Green and force him to join the Rebels, the scorned doctor whips up a few new creations to flip the tables back in his favor. He first sticks a clone of his brain in a new tomato thread he calls Old Tomato, or Old Tomato as the toy line calls him. But when that proves more trouble than it's worth, he creates an all new race of prehistoric warriors, Cave Tomatoes. But in the end, the tide ultimately turns with the introduction of the tomato's natural enemy from half a world away, the African Tomato Worm Tribe. You think that's weird? Just check out the episode titled Tomato Transformation. When the Tomato Task Force gets cornered and I'm expecting the censored lady to pop out in any second to save me the sight of our heroes being plant food, it's revealed being chewed up and spit out by a killer tomato turns humans into... Tomatoes? And tomatoes into humans? What? It makes for a fun flip side kind of body horror adventure. Sure, but tar nations, what a zany idea. Even for this show with no rules. You'll notice that all the blood is, oh, I'm sorry, all the tomato juice is brown. And the reason of that is that the Saturday morning children's fair, the TV gods were concerned that it looked like blood, really. That's kind of the point, but not blood, tomato juice, right? After eight short episodes, the heroes of San Zucchini manage to take the world back from the killer tomatoes with the help of the worms, Gang Green tastes the all too familiar bitterness of defeat, and the tomatoes hightail it for a third season no one knew for sure was coming. 
we wrapped on uh, the final season that we did, and they didn't say this is going to be our final season, but they say we haven't heard anything from the network yet, kids. So we, uh, you know, we hope to. So fingers crossed. But if not, it's been great working with you. The two leading products in the the first two seasons of Fox were Bobby's World and Killer Tomatoes, and they were really close. Bobby's World was probably in first place, and we were in 1.1 place as opposed to second place. Right? We'd we'd be number one one week, they'd be number one for two weeks in a row. We'd be number one another week, you know. But we were pretty darn close. Now the rest of the group of shows kept cycling various things in, trying to make work. But those two shows were working. There was every expectation to renew for a third season. We had discussions as the season was rolling out about what their rating expectations were and what we would have to do in terms of ratings in order to get a third season. We exceeded all of those metrics. But then, you know, the summer replacement thing happened and we had the misfortune of it actually being in our slot. You know, it's the nature of the business. Ratings tell everything. Our ratings were always healthy, but Mighty Morphin Power Rangers hit it out of the park. It was so successful, we didn't make it back to, to that next season. The whole mentality of Fox at that time, was, it's a grand slam or a strikeout, that was sort of their attitude. We thought the series should have continued. It was doing well in the ratings. Um, we knew people liked it. So we made that pitch. Fox decided elsewise. When they make that decision, they don't come and give you a, um, a treatise as to why they made the decision. They just tell you. <laughs> And I would love to have been a fly in the wall to hear the inside conversations of what really happened. No kidding! Guess being a cutting edge cartoon with CGI wasn't impressive enough, huh? I'm surprised that because of that and the cutting edge opportunity there, and there was a lot of marketing around it in the business, that we didn't get renewed for that third year. It wasn't that it was underperforming. They were looking for a superstar. And so they felt after two seasons that it wasn't going to catch fire. A property that always had a schizophrenic personality is because it played to kids, to young kids, and it also played to a hip college audience that saw it very differently. Now, what we missed was actually the most lucrative market, that boys from 13 to 20, they weren't interested in the parody slash satire and the visuals were juvenile form. I think it was also Mattel's lack of success with the line of toys. The one thing we did push back on, and actually Margaret was with us on this, was moving the toy line too soon and making adaptations in the thing to accommodate Mattel. Those conversations were happening between Mattel and Fox, not between us and Mattel. But whether it's fair, it's not fair. I do believe that killed the franchise forced to go A, too young too quick, and B, to accommodate storylines and characters that translated into toys that didn't even make sense to me. Our standing changed, to say the least. In retrospect, didn't realize it was a big deal to have an office on the Fox side. It never occurred to me. And now I look back and I go, yeah, it's kind of foolish. I probably should have been hanging out and having you know, breakfast at one of the many restaurants I never learned the name of. Oh, my plan's ruined! Speaking of ruined plans... For the direct-to-video release of Killers Made a Strike Back, copies of the VHS promoted the contest with some pretty impressive prizes. Viewers who bothered calling a number to answer two easy questions want a chance at receiving a buttload of Killers Made a cartoon merch, from t-shirts to toys to games, and a shot at the grand prize, a 10-day trip for two to Rome! Sounds like a sweet winning, but we'd much rather have the next prize in line, an animated cameo in the Killer Tomatoes cartoon! Well, sucks for whoever won this, because it looks like the sweepstakes ended after the show was canceled. Can y'all give us any insight into this promotional stunt? No, I mean, it must have been a, obviously it was a Fox promotion that they did. Well, let's hope that poor sucker's consolation prize was the next piece of tomato merch in line from Nintendo game based on the cartoon! Game Greens built a doomsday tomato that turns sand zucchini into tomato paste, and six revamped versions of the gang of six after Chad to stop him from saving the day. Along the way, battles include a throwdown with the fan tomato of the opera and Larry, the mountain-sized tomato, both characters from episodes written by Richard Mueller. It's nice to hear when anything goes farther than you created it. I knew Haim from politics. He was on the board of Regent. When Haim ends up buying these children's network, Margaret left, so there was nobody left at Fox who we had done business with. Tomatoes made a 
have one this day, but tomorrow, they're ketchup. After that occurred, I got a call from Margaret and said, you need to call Haim. I don't see a lot of point in meeting him. Haim has a deal that works for him. It doesn't work for me. And she goes, well, this might be different. So I go down and I go to, I go to Haim's office and I meet him. They were looking at launching a Sunday evening nighttime cartoon network for adults. When we get into television and we're in the children's market, you had to go all in on a children's product. If we could have called our shots, we'd have much rather have gone into a evening program. Haim, I am told, he had already apparently begun some partially produced episodes because apparently they got going before they realized they didn't have the rights. He didn't have the ability to produce episodes without doing another business deal with us. Really wasn't in their economic interest to do a lot because the merchandising had all gone flat. And then they ultimately didn't launch the network anyway. So it became academic. We didn't have any interest in pushing them because there were provisions in the contract that said, if they don't do certain things, we get all the rights back. Well, did you get the rights back to the cartoon already? I mean, it's been 30 years now. The only way to watch this amazing show is bootlegs and YouTube. I don't know why it hasn't, and the ways of Hollywood are mysterious. When you make a distribution deal, quite often you sort of kiss your baby goodbye. Sometimes you get to, you know, maintain some level of control. Every deal's different. I'm not sure why it hasn't been released, but I think it, it's the, sort of a bottom-up kind of thing. If there's enough grassroots support and, and somebody thinks they can make a shekel or two uh, at the distributor, I would think that uh, maybe it could happen. I mean, look, I'm not a cartoon guy. I'm not an expertise, either as a matter of audience or producer. They, I think they did a good job with it. Would I have done it the same? No, but I probably would have screwed it up. We're about as outside of Hollywood as you can get. We didn't know anybody in the film business at all, zero. We made this on our own, learning it by the seat of our pants and reading books and stuff. We culturally had ideas. We tried to work closely with the people that were writing the checks and had the vision. And we were successful at limiting our ambitions, hitting singles and doubles. And we made a reasonable amount of, of money for a very successful commercial production and sports production company. I used to kid around that we had two businesses. One made money and the other, you know, threw it away trying to make movies. At that point, I'd done four of them. We'd had the cartoon show. So that was good for me at the time and uh, really didn't do much after that. I think there's still lots of fun left in the concept. We'd like to do another film or more, but success brings success in this business. And go Hollywood Outsiders, without getting somebody to want to fund your project, you don't go anywhere. We're hopeful if we can, you know, launch something and it's popular, then, then there could be more going forward. I'm, I'm hopeful we can do that. So I take it the most recent Muppet Baby series didn't stir up interest like before with its obvious ode to that Killer Tomatoes episode? <laughs> no, I'm not regularly watching Muppet Babies. I'll have to add it to my, uh, my schedule. And then, of course, we're in a very unique position of still owning our property. And that's the other reason why we didn't produce anything over the last 20 years is we only reacquired the right relatively recently. If they called me for another one, I'd go for it. They were delightful to work with. I have enjoyed their success. It wasn't what I wanted to do as a career. I was headed other directions. Do I regret the decision? I don't. It worked out fine for me. Costa and I have remained fast friends. Costa was the best man at my wedding. I can't even stop telling you how many people I enjoyed working with. There wasn't a weak link in the whole thing. That was the beauty of it. I've never seen a movie I've been in. I was very fortunate, and the roles I got wasn't because of my acting, it's because of who I was. And I'm very, very happy that people actually hired me for a few, a few small gigs. I mean, I still get letters about it. I feel blessed to be in that group. I just had a ball doing it. I mean, yeah, it was a lot of work, but I really enjoyed it. I always thought it was uh, one of the highlights of my career. You know, that plus being signed on Columbia and RCA, but Killer Tomatoes is right up that. The fact that we actually had people who turned out to have a, a career in, in the entertainment industry is kind of amazing. It was really the beginning of my career. To have a start like that, where you're surrounded with nothing but 
wonderful people and kind and funny that I was like, oh my gosh, I can get used to doing this every day because this is just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Like, sure, I'd like to be in Titanic or some other, like, uh, there will be blood or some great, you know, Academy Award, but I also like the idea of being in something really cheesy. So being in uh, the Killer Tomatoes movie feels kind of culty and weird and, I don't know, like, you'll, that goes to your grave with you. And then it was very hard to shake those movies because everybody always wanted to talk about that. You know, I have worked on other stuff. I was working on sitcoms and commercials. I worked on Married with Children for seven years and in Living Color and big movies like Hook and Batman and Groundhog Day. And there's something about those movies that people love and will always love. To this day, I can go pretty much anywhere in the world and somebody will mention Killer Tomatoes and somebody's eyes will light up and they're smiling because it's fun or they heard of it or they saw it. I was in the Keys and this girl got a tomato and put eyeballs on it out of paper. And she had a knife and was doing this. I got pictures of her doing it. I was, dude, that's, that's wild. It was just a nice chapter in my, on a totally unplanned career. Here in Atlanta, we have a killer tomato festival. Everything that has tomatoes in it, it kind of thing. And it's a really fun deal. Yeah, we're very much aware of the festival and we talk to them every year. We generally send them something to raffle off. Probably our most significant licensing agreement, though, is a long-term license that we've had for almost two decades now with the company that manufactures target balloons for the United States Navy. They're big red balloons that float out in the ocean, and they call them killer tomatoes. I never, ever, ever thought I'd made it. It's always, it's either a character flaw or a character strength. I'm always looking over the hill. It was sure pure fun from start to finish. It was exciting, it was exhilarating. It was a creative exercise for us. It's a, it was the most fun time of my life. We were not looking at it, I, I think maybe uh, the way we could have in terms of elevating just that franchise. It was a fun movie, it caught fire, we always enjoyed it. Um, but we also had many other interests as well. So we ran with it and did some things with it, but a lot of it was, you know, sort of seat of the pants and uh, a little bit guerrilla style, and that was the spirit of the, of the first movie. Comedy finds its own audience. Drama is a universal, but comedies are specific. You like a particular kind of comedy or you don't. I think our films find their audience just like any other comedies find their audience. Go we'll see it. And there you have it, Screen Freaks, the deepest cut and retrospective you're ever likely to see in the history of the Attack of the Killers Made a series. Fun, wasn't it? It definitely was, DW, and I can't think of anybody better than you to tell this epic Killer Tomato tale. If y'all had told me when Screaming Sue first started that I'd one day be collaborating with the creators of the Killer Tomatoes while yakking it up with Adam's Family Royalty, Olympic Champions, Emmy-winning voice boxes, and Miss Universe Knockouts, I'd sooner believe me becoming a mascot for tapeworm diets. And as if it's any guess, I highly recommend this off-the-wall series for everyone to check out. From the big screen to the idiot box, I give Attack of the Killer Tomatoes 1 through 4, along with a cartoon, of course. 5 out of 5, would Killer Tomatoes Eat France is my personal favorite of the bunch, thanks to all the mutant tomatoes starring in it. A huge thank you to Foursquare Productions for giving me their blessing to tell such an amazing story of indie filmmakers defying all odds with such a crazy concept. Thanks to the cast and crew involved, who were kind enough to give me the time of day to collect their memories making this outrageous series. And a special thank you to y'all who pitched in to help me complete this project on the production side of things. You know who you are. But until next time, I'll see you later, Scream Freaks! Scream Freaks. Well, thank you kindly for watching and help yourself for more servings of Screaming Sue by visiting our site at ScreamingSue.com. You can read our weekly updates, character bios, and interviews, catch up on past episodes, browse our store, and drool over the howling hottie of the week. If you want to scream at us, just holler at ScreamingSue at gmail.com and don't forget to stalk us through social media conveniently linked at the top of the site. If you want to scream at us, just holler at ScreamingSoup at gmail.com and don't forget to stalk us through social media conveniently linked at the top of the site.